All right, good afternoon. I'd like to call the Beltrami County uh, work meeting to order. So the first order of business is introduction of new employees. Seeing none, we will uh, carry on to item three, identify future work meeting topics. I think we got enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, one one that I would like to maybe um, discuss is maybe yeah, I, I think the meeting in uh, Leech Lake went and went well, you know, and and Ten Lake. That I would like to you know maybe have a couple of more uh, throughout the county. I know we had some discussions last year uh, where we were going to try to meet with Red Lake, but that didn't uh, that didn't happen. And and I know. Uh, we were talking about maybe meeting in Black Duck uh, this year. So um, if we can you know, coordinate something like that uh, for the summer months, um, and if there are any other uh, commissioners that would, would like to do that as well, um, just uh, let myself or Tom know and we can try to arrange something uh, to, to host the meeting in, in your uh, respective districts. So if there are no other uh, items for, for discussion, we will move on to item four, history of Mississippi Headwaters Board. Mr. Terrell. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm just here to, uh, this is a video that I've been wanting to create for like four years, and I finally had the opportunity. We created it, we played it at our biennial conference, and it literally just changed the entire uh, culture of what we were doing. It was more like less of a conference and more of a reunion. So with that in mind, we're going to uh, play the video and then I just got some final thoughts there. And I built in a few minutes for technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have it. Bob Lassard, who served in the Minnesota State Senate 26 years from 1978 to 2004, has been called a sly fox and the old trapper. But anyone who took him for granted was fooling themselves. During his first term, it was the result of his actions that the Mississippi Headwaters Board became a reality. Never been in politics before. I've just been elected, and I never, in hindsight, I never thought I could get this done. There's something about being a freshman senator. You think you can do stuff? I, in hindsight, I never would have done it. I, I would have thought it'd been impossible. Known as a supporter of a clean environment, Bob's handshake was his word. He once told a reporter, the thing that kept me going was protecting the rights of people who made Minnesota the state it is. The federal government and the state often come in and say, we know best. But hunters and fishermen have been stewards of the environment forever, and protecting their rights is important. It was in that spirit that was behind Bob advocating and passing the legislation that made the management of the Mississippi headwaters a reality. It was tough. I, uh, I don't think I went to bed. It, it was really emotional with me. The cause of the concern of Bob Lissard and others in the region was the result of the enactment of the Federal Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968 that had the intention of protecting the natural free-flowing rivers, including the first 400 miles of the Upper Mississippi River, which the government wanted to turn into a linear national park. But with the creation of a national park would come federal control, which would include the acquisition and condemnation of private property. Much like had been done in Voyagers National Park, Bob and others felt strongly that the Upper Mississippi would instead benefit from local control. But to stop federal government would take an outpouring of people living in the eight counties of northern Minnesota, where the first 400 miles flowed. I called all the counties together that were affected, and I said that if we don't get together and do it under local control, it's a disaster. For three years, Bob traveled throughout the region, rallying the local people. So I go to all the county boards, what we would do every time the National Park Service would hold a hearing, 
I don't care if it'd be Aiken, it was, if it would be Bermidji, if it would be Grand Rapids, if it could be Brainerd, whatever, we would hold a meeting in the same town at the same time. And they'd have maybe 50 and we'd have 300 to fight the federal government to keep it in local control, to keep it out of the federal system that we formed what's called the Headwaters Board. It was a massive undertaking, requiring eight counties to be in agreement. Through their hard work and support, the Mississippi Headwaters Board was created in 1980. Since then, the board has rigorously acted to protect the first 400 miles of the Mississippi River. But it didn't stop there. Since its charter at the Mississippi Headwaters Board, in cooperation with the eight counties, has instituted several programs that have enhanced the safety of the water, made travel down the Mississippi an enjoyable experience, created navigation signage for those who enjoy paddling in a canoe or kayak on the Mississippi River river and supported the effort of establishing parks along the river. One of the first tasks the Mississippi Headwaters Board took on was local zoning. Zoning is it's kind of like a bulldozer. In the right hand, it can do a lot of good. It can shape, make things very pretty. But in the wrong hand, or in, if it's misused or guided correctly, it can cause a lot of damage. So that's why county commissioners were given this responsibility. That is something so unique about this Mississippi Headwaters Board is that they have county commissioners and they're here to protect one thing, the Mississippi River. Yet with eight counties needing to be in agreement on something as fundamental to the rights of landowners and their governmental units, disagreements happened. So there needed to be a way to settle disputes. In the 80s, there was a lot of fighting going on between the board and counties and state and other agencies, not out of ill will, but just trying to understand what that law meant. Who had, we, we had our jurisdiction set, but if a county had something that maybe was less stringent than the Mississippi Headwaters Board plan, who won? In the early 80s, it went to a district court and it was decided that the Mississippi Headwaters Board trumps all county regulations. And you got to remember, in this time, some of the regulations that were put on by the Mississippi Headwaters Board were new. They were progressive. Whereas today we look at them and say, well, that pretty makes common sense. But at that time, it wasn't common sense. Once the jurisdictional duties were made clear by the court, individual board members were able to act with clarity, not just being another layer of government, but being a watchdog, an overseer, because the Mississippi Headwaters Board is actually a regulatory agency. Where the 1980s were a period of zoning, the 1990s were about blending zoning regulation with education and community programs. This included a river watch program, which got students involved in testing the river. There was also a river of defense network, which provided spill containment equipment to some of the cities along the river in case there was some kind of toxic spill. In addition, a guidebook was developed to help those visiting the river to learn about its history, what people could expect to find in the areas around the river, and the importance of protecting our natural resources. Due to funding deficiencies in the early 2000s, it was decided that an executive secretary would be kept rather than an executive director to work only with the regulatory zoning authority of the board. This led to the Mississippi Headwaters Board being perceived as a duplicative since county zoning regulations were somewhat compatible with the comprehensive plan. So, in the early 2010s, the Mississippi Headwaters Board made a change in direction and held a series of strategic planning sessions to determine its role going forward. It was at that time that a new executive director job description was written. The board wanted someone who had entrepreneurial skills and was willing to take risks. After interviewing several candidates, they chose Tim Terrell, who understood the need for more aggressive initiatives to add to existing regulatory programs in order to protect the quality of the water of the Mississippi River itself. So one of the unique things that we started right out of the gate was an idea to assess the watershed for risk and how much risk factors are on the Mississippi River on these small watersheds that drain directly to the Mississippi River. It was pretty unique at its time because we know in this area up here, it's beautiful place. If you look at it from Google Maps, it's all green. So everybody thinks, well, there's not much to do up here. But what we did is we assessed and we found out quite a bit of a risk, uh, different disturbed land, how much percent public land were in these watersheds, what did we need to get to to call this watershed protected, and we developed a whole chart and process. From that study, organizational systems and programs like One Watershed, One Plan began implementing this systematic breakdown of watersheds on a larger scale.
In addition, Mississippi Headwaters Board implemented a regional stormwater assessment in several of the cities with frontage on the Mississippi. It allows cities and counties to determine sites where stormwater runoff can be cleaned prior to it entering the Mississippi River. That's what the Mississippi Headwaters Board does. Because it has a leadership uh, role in, in what it does, it creates a context by which things can get done and by which other implementation organizations can use. Another program taken on by the Mississippi Headwaters Board are the problems caused by aquatic invasive species, which include zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and others. To help educate the public, the Mississippi Headwaters Board created Facebook and Twitter sites. So far, it's been one of our successful social media programs. We've got about 30,000 followers on Facebook and over 7,000 on Twitter. So we are doing really good with reaching people before they get it. For people traveling on the Mississippi River, a series of navigational signage was produced to allow the recreationalists to know where they are and how long it will take them to get from one upstream river landing to another downstream landing. When you go to a lake, you pull up, you know where that spot is, you go on the lake, you recreate all day, and you come back to that same spot. You can't do that on the Mississippi River. There's DNR landings and accesses where you can access the landing, but you go downstream. And most people have absolutely no idea how long it's gonna take them to get from one landing to the next. To help paddlers enjoy the Mississippi River and familiarize them with the navigational signage, the Mississippi Headwaters Board created the concept of resource tainment events where people can travel the river and enjoy an educational or entertainment event at the end of their journey. Local county and city tourism organizations partnered with the Mississippi Headwaters Board to host these annual events, and there is a coordinated effort to promote these events across the first 400 miles of the Mississippi River. What I like about working for the Mississippi Headwaters Board is there's an environmental concern, the natural, the recreational, the cultural, the scientific and historical value that we want to protect of the Mississippi River. But there's also the civic part that comes into it. County commissioners with their wisdom, they're able to take that, what we're doing, and put it in perspective. And keeping perspective is so important because it's the greatest river in the land. It comes down to caring about the river and its importance to our lives. Members of the Mississippi Headwaters Board, working with those living along its path, understand the importance of the river, the quality of its water, the land around it, and the experience of those who use it. Why should the average person care that the Mississippi River is here? Does it matter in your day-to-day -day life? Probably not. Does it trigger your imagination? Does it remind you that we're connected from one place to another, that you can start up here in the pines and go down to the bayous and still be connected if, because of this river? You know, if you're a geologist, a river is just a drain. It's really not the significant part of the landscape. But for us, it's visible and it really reminds us of who was here before, where we're going, where we can be. You know, water is something that every one of us needs. You know, a huge percent of our body is made of water. Where does it come from? We don't, we are, nobody's making more of it. We only have what we have. And so to protect the Mississippi is to protect not just trade, but a major source of drinking water, which protects the health and welfare of everyone that lives up and down that river. From here all the way down to New Orleans, I think education is important about the river so people know why we wanna give it some room, room to filter and a room to provide habitat and room so that if you have a house on the river, you aren't on a bend where you're gonna get wiped out every time you have a spring flood. Just knowledge is really important. But the Mississippi River is the lifeblood, the main artery of the United States. Stay within river. All right, so that's our video that we made there. It's pretty informative. We kind of wanted to, it's the stories. It's nothing that you wouldn't read in the newspaper. It's the stories that we got on there that really made it interesting. So closing thoughts here, um, a lasting impression. Uh, we're, Mississippi Headwaters Board has gained the reputation of being innovative and creative. And uh, what, what could, I just thought to myself, okay, context, we create the context, we connect others, but what's our identity? I mean, what can we kind of be analogous to that somebody could just say it 
and we would understand exactly. And you may have noticed that I have this up, up by your uh, places. This is a little thing of salt. So just kind of look at MHB as a figurative example of salt. Well, salt's a preservative and you know we're trying to preserve the Mississippi River. So that's a common thing that we can all understand. But you know, I got the rest of these from a book by Charles Swindoll and it wasn't talking about the Mississippi Headwaters Board, but it just seemed to fit so well, I just used it. And uh, it says, salt is like any, unlike any other seasoning. It can't be, it can't be uh, duplicated, but it must be applied before it's useful. It can't just sit there, it's gotta be applied. And along that same lines, um, salt, is, salt is shaken and sprinkled, but it's never poured. So as the Mississippi Headwaters Board, we need to know when do we move forward? When do we have to step back when we're a detriment? And where, where's that balance at? And that's what our board helps us when we discuss things. Where, where, where's our place in this? And that another thing is, is that you know, salt adds flavor, but it's not really noticed. When you go to Thanksgiving, nobody ever said, wow, that was the best tasting salt I ever had. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not there. It's a compliment to things. And, you know, we had a zest when, you, when, we, when we work with others. And, you know, it's impossible to achieve something without us. We, we add that extra component that makes it so much more valuable. So my final thoughts are, uh, you know, come work with us. And you, you have worked with us. And your Bemidji project is definitely an example. Um, but whenever you do work with us, it's probably going to be on uncharted territory. The outcome's gonna be uncertain, but it's gonna be an adventure every step of the way. And that's what we can do. We can add excitement and fun to what we're doing. And that's what makes it enjoyable. So comments or questions, maybe there's something you wanna say that stood out to you from this video or anything like that, but I encourage that. Questions, comments? Um, for myself, you know, I, I want to say that it was a, it was a pretty pretty good video. You know, I, uh, it was nice to see that and hear you know some of the history behind of um, how this all took place um, with Senator Lassard, Um, You know, and, and I imagine that it was wasn't uh, an easy task, but uh, you know, I'm thankful that we uh, we have that in place today. So. Um, you know, I appreciate your work and, and, you know, the board's work on, 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 you know, preserving, you know, what, what, uh, is needed, you know, for the future. And, and, you know, thanks for explaining the salt. You know, I was, I was up here and I was thinking, well, did somebody uh, have some lunch up here and forgot their salt packet? So thanks. <laughs> but any other comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll just, I, I just, I found it really interesting. I didn't know that that was the history of the, of the Headwaters Board. That was a fascinating little, little history of, of, it was a lot of work to, it's hard to beat City Hall, you know, it's hard to beat the feds. And that's, that's a pretty, pretty interesting story. So thank you. It took two or three years of Lassard's life. He said it every day he was working on this. I found it interesting that the, the, for, the National Park Service would hold a meeting, they'd have 50 and he would duplicate it and have 300. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, as you know, I sit on that board and, and uh, Tim has done a great job for us and um, a lot of the resources from the three cent sales tax and things like that, that uh, we utilize to gain um, use through easements and other things to protect the, you know, whether it's a wild rice easement or whatever uh, other types of easements that landowners are able to, to cooperate with. It's voluntary. So they're not forced to do something, but it uh, um, it's a win-win for, for everybody. So good job, Tim. Thanks for bringing the video. Mr. Chair, I also find it refreshing, the, just the video itself. It gives you hope that, you know what, you can fight some of those big uh, <laughs> entities. So thanks. And in mid-March, it's nice to see open water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and blue skies and yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you. And the highlight of the project was we highlighted Bemidji at our biennial conference with that, we call it uh, the Lake Irving project. And, you know, from that, you know, Bemidji is going to spend time and money to do the whole city and look for it, you know, and that's where we wanted to be. And your one watershed, one plan is writing that in. So it's not that we're the first ones to think of it, but we're like the first ones to do it. And then everybody says, oh, well, if they can do it on a regional scale, maybe we can do it in our neck of the woods. So thank you very much for your time. Well, as, as a partner, you're always welcome back. Thank you, Tim.
All right, we will move on to item five, the bailiff office expansion. And uh, before we begin, uh, Sheriff, I, I do apologize if uh, if I didn't do the, the the project justice on chat about today. <laughs> oh. I didn't listen, so. Okay, good. <laughs> so I appreciate your time. And, and uh, today, uh, uh, before you, uh, uh, we have a little bit of background information about uh, the expansion of our bailiff's office. Uh, Sergeant Grimsley is going to come up. She's got a PowerPoint for you. And uh, our failure to get you that PowerPoint other than in printed form here, but it'll kind of explain things, show you a few pictures of what we're dealing with. So originally back in uh, 21, um, CARES money was, uh, was appropriated for the expansion of the bailiff's office. Uh, our bailiff's office currently has 14 employees in it. It was originally designed to have five employees using that space. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a small space. It's, it's very full inside there with everything that is contained. So we had an opportunity here uh, with the CARES money to be able to expand that office and take an essentially an unused room as part of the clerk of court's office uh, and expand and, and essentially build them a second uh, room uh, onto their bailiff's office. There are a set of plans that were sent over and uh, just to orient you to the plans, uh, if you're looking at them with the writing at the top of the page, Minnesota Avenue is on your left-hand side. And uh, if you look in the set, the center of the building, there's a, some hash mark uh, square, a, rec a rectangular that goes around, and that's the area that they're talking about that would be changed. Not a lot of work, but one of the most expensive things we found out was uh, we needed to change some of the HVAC stuff. But uh, when the CARES money first came around, uh, we didn't get uh, an opportunity to use the money for the room because we were working on the license bureau at the time, and uh, it just it, it didn't have enough time to get done. Um, and then later on in, in 22, it was put on for having ARPA money being able to be used and, uh, for that, and it didn't happen then. So coming to you today to ask you if you would take a look at that, reconsider that. Uh, again, it's not only safety and security of our staff, um, and, uh, uh, but it's better use and expansion of that office and, and use that space for them to, to do their work. So with that, I'll have uh, Trish come up and, uh, and explain things in the PowerPoint. And we'll have any questions. Uh, any questions. Hi, I'm Trish Grimsley. Thanks for having me. I'm the sergeant for at the courthouse, the court security, and the transport division. So, as he took a lot of my opening, but um, I just wanted to say that uh, we've been looking forward to this for two years, having the plans in place. We've walked through with an engineer, um, not only once, but twice. Once since I've been sergeant, I've been sergeant since June. And um, we've notice some things that work for us and don't work with us off of that plan. So we would need another plan drawn. But I just want to let you know that like during COVID, we had social distancing issues. I know COVID numbers are down, but it's still, we, COVID will always be a problem. And so will other illnesses of flus. Um, so we had problems social distancing. We have 11 employees currently, 14 total. We're hiring for three more, so we're full staff. And we're fitting 14 people in 312 square foot room. So this is one major room. There's a photo that I provided. And you can see in that space that we have seven people working. Uh, we had others that were already on transports, already working at the front desk and in courtrooms. So realistically, in this picture, the picture with um, everybody in it here, um, you can add about six more people to this, and that's how much space we have to get ready in the morning to uh, do our jobs, to eat lunches. This room is used for our break room, our office, our lunch room, our training room. We have meetings in here, and we also have storage in here. We have multiple different reasons for this office. We store our law enforcement gear and some less less lethal, sorry, less lethal items in the back of the courthouse because we don't have room in our current office. And that's actually in the um, visiting judges chambers, which doesn't um, really help us if there's an emergency situation, it's not readily available for us. Uh, we also have uniforms, spare equipment, vehicle parts, and spare emergency kits in four different locations inside the courthouse. And different floors of the courthouse and storage space. Uh, another improvement we would like to do is a screening area at the front. It gets pretty congested when the public is coming through screening. 
there's a small area for port security to work together and they're constantly bumping into each other also. As the sheriff stated, we have HVAC issues. Um, maintenance has told us for years that they know that there is an issue in our office. All the hot air comes into our office, so it gets very hot. Uh, even during the summer, it's hot, doesn't cool down very much. And we're working in our gear and it gets very uncomfortable. We also have the fingerprint room that is on first floor. We put it in there and it does not have any separate kind of HVAC or cooling in there. Um, when we are providing fingerprints to civilians, we uh, often like it, it's hot in there, it gets muggy, their palms get wet and it's really hard to struggle to get quality fingerprints taken. It takes us some time. Um, in this picture here, in the second picture, it's an office space that space uh, right off of our main office area. It's just another computer space for us, but we also walk people in that we take into custody. We have to walk them through our office space to get them over to the jail. And those are our two office spaces that we currently have. And then um, the next photo is our court administration workroom. That is this photo here with the printer in the middle and the door in the back. Uh, that's currently for court administration. They use it for their printer and storage area for office supplies. Um, it's currently bigger than both of our work rooms together. And there is a plan already in place of where they would relocate that. And there was a date also uh, back in 2021. And this space would actually create three more workstations for us. So we would have a total of six. Um, for our 14 employees, and then we would have extra space for our law enforcement equipment in the secure door right here. There's already shelving. It's um, secure. Just we would be able to go in and out of it. Nobody else. All of our gear would be able to be in one spot. And then, let's see here. Then, on the next page, we have pictures of our front desk security. So this is another area that we would need to improve on. Our uh, current setup, it works well, but I don't think in the plans when they originally built this knew the amount of people that would be coming into the courthouse on a daily basis. We keep record of that. If you're ever curious, I have uh, graphs of what all comes into the courthouse. Um, the problem is in this second picture, this area here by this fire extinguisher, it's a very small area. We get people through security just fine, but this area gets a lot of congestion. People are putting on their belts, their coats, they're getting their stuff back together from security screening. They're waiting for their parties. It's hard to move them along in this small area. So then it gets backed up. During COVID with the six foot guidelines, we had to have people backed up all the way outside on the sidewalks. We had little X's marked for them. Wish we didn't have to do that, but, um, but also pre-COVID during our busy times, we often had people lining up outside in you know, the winter and the rain and stuff, just because we have to securely get people through, we have to take our time to do it, so we do it safely. Sergeant, um, can, can I ask, Mr. Chair, sorry, can I just ask a historical question? When, when the building was designed, we had no, we didn't have, we didn't design the building to have this security, right? This is, this is the result of the, the shooting that happened in another Northern County where then county courthouses kind of um, hardened their entrances? Actually, we were one of the first ones to do that. Um, it was designed into the building to have this. It was, yeah. okay. Um, and, uh, and Shane's here, and Shane could get up and talk about it as well. Uh, he was originally part of the planning when this first started before he transferred over to the, the Veterans uh, Service Office uh, and helping Trish put some of these things together. But uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't plan accordingly when we put the screening process in. Okay. Uh, it's extremely tight. If you've been to the courthouse lately, you know, onesies, twosies get in no problem. But if you're waiting for a uh, jury to start in the morning and you've got uh, 30, 40 people backed up all the way on in the street, it gets to be difficult to get everybody through screening. Uh, the screening instrument itself uh, is much larger than the old one. The old one had it met its end of life. So this new one comes in and it takes up a lot of room. And I don't know if you can see the two deputies kind of standing there. It's such a narrow space, they can't stand side by side, and that's their workstation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, taking people in, checking IDs, checking stuff going through the screening instrument, uh, plus being able to wand them if they get anything that actually shows up on the, on the instrument. Sorry to sidetrack you, but I just wanted to have that historical context. Thank You're you. Fine. Yep. <laughs> And like you said, um, the two deputies saying there, we often work two to three up there and we're shuffling past each other. We, get, we barely squeeze in between the wall and the equipment. Um, one of the plans would be to move the wall back and create slanted ends and that would create more room for us. It would be able to uh, help us reposition the equipment for a better flow, especially for a wider flow at the end when they're gathering their items. And I was, I was just going to mention about that wall, as you can see, it's just a stub wall. Uh, it doesn't go all the way to the ceilings. It's just a, I think it's a 10 foot high wall. Um, so it would take up the space, uh, some of the space that we set aside to get on and off the elevator. Uh, there's lots of room right here for that. Maybe expand to the east part of the north and south. I think even an extra foot or two there would be helpful for that process. And then also with the desk area here. The public and employees, they often come up behind there here and we're working right here. So they come up behind us, we're quiet sometimes, we can't hear them and all of a sudden they're They can view what we're viewing on our computers, they can see our camera systems. It's not CEDIS compliant. Um, basically, we don't follow the policy of the FBI as far as privacy data. Um, we, we try with screen protectors, but they're still very visible to us. This would also create a sit to stand stand desk for us. Um, we have three small monitors currently there, but we monitor all the cameras on the front campus and we have two larger monitors and a space for them. Um, what is going to help us monitor the cameras even better and track down people as we're watching them walk through the uh, campus. And then our in the photo. The locker room addition. So we currently, like I stated, we use our office area as also our locker room. We get ready in there in the morning. Um, when we're full staff, we have 14 people in there and it gets very, very congested. Um, we have extra uniforms on our third floor and a maintenance storage room that we currently house. We bring our new hires up there to try on temporary uniforms. And we also house some other kind of equipment up there. The locker room would be a good addition. There is in our basement of the courthouse, there's an open space on this page. There's an open space and I talked to Steve Shattuck and he um, also agreed that it is a space that would easily be um, put into two, a male and a female locker room. We would take the vending machines out. There's room downstairs to keep the vending machines and all the rest of the items in those rooms are in gold storage. So this space would be able to provide us with a place to get ready in the morning, more space in our office as we take out the bank of lockers that's currently there and it would open up our space some. And also it would keep our personal stuff uh, separate from our workspace and it would help us out with, you know, bringing illnesses or uh, things from home into our workspace. Another, um, let's see here. Oh, another thing at the front desk we would like to see is permanent shatterproof glass barrier. We were able to put up the plexiglass as everybody else did around the county and we didn't realize how much the public comes in and they're standing here, we're sitting here, we're standing here behind our desk and they're hopping on us and automatically they like to put their jackets down and their items down on top of our workspace and then it falls into our computer area. Sometimes the front desk people work up there, they, have, they can't leave, they have to eat lunches too. Um, so having that glass, that plexiglass barrier has really helped, but it still creates an issue because it's not permanently set down. So there has been times when we get people coming in that are angry and I had one guy shake this barrier and I'm thinking it's gonna fall on me and having just a glass permanent barrier would be really beneficial for us. Um, like I, uh, he stated, there were five bailiffs working when they started, when they opened the place. And there were only three courtrooms running at the time. Now we have five courtrooms and we have uh, four permanent judges. And we also have visiting judges. We have federal juries, federal judges, child support. Uh, we do a lot more there than when they did when they first opened. And now we've uh, doubled 
a little over double our work staff and it's just a very small environment to work in. When one of us <coughs> gets sick, kind of all of us get sick. <laughs> we noticed during COVID, um, we did send half of our employees home when one of our employees got sick. There just, there was very little way to distance ourselves in there. And it's the same even after COVID with the flu and sicknesses. Court administration has access into our area as well. This would create a door separate for them and separate for us. So then again, we're seen as compliant um, and their illnesses that they bring into our office just stay in their office and just stay in ours. So <laughs> are there any questions? Anything you have to add? What is the, uh, Trish talked about putting the door between court administration and uh, uh, her office. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but three years ago we got hacked. And during that process of getting hacked, of course, uh, uh, it put us on the list for having an audit done. And we found out that we, uh, when we had the audit, we failed miserably uh, in the security stuff, part side of our, our uh, computer systems. One of the things they called for is that everybody needed to be uh, CGIS. Uh, compliant, and they need to have security awareness. The clerk of court's office runs by a, uh, a different set of rules and standards that we do. And uh, I tell you, I was when I wanted to shut off their access so they couldn't come into our office so we could be compliant, it caused a lot of problems. I need to keep that access open. So this would allow us to um, become CPS compliant also by putting the door in there that we can lock it. Oh, it gets open from our side. So, any questions about? Um, I don't have a dollar for you. Uh, <laughs> at, at one point, Steve was working on that, and then uh, that kind of got pushed off until we're here to get you to, or get you, uh, ask you to say, yeah, why don't you move forward, see what it's going to cost, come back to us a little later with some prices, and uh, what, is, what does this look like in the long run? Um, there is ARPA money available. I wish Jared was here because he was part of that committee when they decided that all that was going to happen, but uh, he's stuck in another meeting now. About a reset coordinator, unless Shane has anything he wants to add. As Shane is coming up, uh, Bernie, uh, is there any, is this any part of the plan with the feasibility study? Is that it's not? No, okay. no. Wish it could. Uh, if we could put something together with that, uh, the clerk of court's office and everybody that uses that, uh, the, the courthouse. That they were part of the interviews because you know we do have a tunnel between the old the jail and the courthouse and that gets utilized for moving prisoners back and forth it does make it really much safe. I don't know if you remember back in the days that they used to come out the front door and walk down the sidewalk and then come you know, to the front door and that's how you see it. So, uh, but we addressed that. Uh, gosh, I can't even remember how many years ago, a uh, long time ago, by putting in that tunnel. But uh, they, yeah, again, it, uh, it was in the cares. It was all part of the CARES thing, and then we kind of got forgotten about in that thing because we were running late on the year with using the CARES money, and then it got moved to ARPA money and somehow forgot to get put in to the appropriation. Well, Sheriff, uh, I, I guess I got a couple of questions. Um, uh, you, you guys mentioned uh, CGIS uh, a few times. Uh, Criminal well, Justice Information System. So okay. that's the FBI. Okay. and the information that's exchanged on those computer systems. So one of the things we need to do, um, and we'll be coming back in the future to address the fact that our windows on our law enforcement center are not CGIS compliant. People can see in and they can read that information that's on those computers. And only privileged people can see that information. They have to go through uh, security awareness and be CGIS compliant. Um, right now, we don't have anything that can be put on those windows. Um, and Steve is looking at how much that would cost to replace those windows with uh, a compliant material. Um, but when people are in that office and they come up behind them, all of that information, if they've got warrant information out, if they've got HRO, uh, 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 bankos, any of that information, they're not supposed to be able to see. Um, and they can walk up in there and look at it. And so it's not see just compliant. Um, and also, uh, you know, Tricia, you, you did, I think you did a, a, a great job, you know, with the presentation, um, you kind of, kind of sold me, uh, but I was looking for a, a dollar figure and I couldn't find it. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, uh, Tom could help us out on, on trying to figure out, you know, the cost of this. And, and I know, uh, there was, uh, CARES money and, and ARPA money and, and, so, I mean, I guess I don't know if there's um, 
if there if there's still any CARES money left, or if it would just be coming from from ARPA, you know. So I mean, I think those are part of the discussion that I would like to have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's no more CARES money available. That was all returned. That didn't get spent. Fortunately, the county spent all of its CARES funding funding anyway. Uh, there were deadlines before that funding had to be completely utilized. Uh, there is ARP money, however. Uh, when the committee was together, the budget committee came together on this uh, to develop the 2022 fiscal year budget. Um, ARPA dollars were identified for the bailiff remodel to the tune of $140,000. Um, we don't know that that's what the cost will be at this point because it hasn't been designed. But I believe that the sheriff's here to essentially get your blessing to move to design knowing that there is that 140,000. And of course, whatever the design dictates in regards to costs, um, that'll have to come back to you for an additional approval. I would like to state also that that, um, that number was for the, just the remodel of the office itself, not the front desk and not the locker rooms. Mm -hmm. Bigger drawings than these, uh, <laughs> and then have a magnifying glass, and the readers didn't do it justice either. <laughs> right, yeah. to, to figure out what, what was what and where the stuff was right. going on that teeny little drawing. Um, I would like to you know, be able to see more moving hopefully, forward. And hopefully, we have those. Uh, this is what we received from Steve, uh, the, what the conceptual drawing would look like, and that one rectangular area is the area that would be affected. Not all of that's going to change. Because there's electrical in there, there's elevators are in there. Uh, it would just that's just the footprint of what would be changed um, inside there. If you were to, if you're standing in the bailiff's office, essentially we're going to take the wall that's right at the backside of the bailiff's office, and we're going to take that out and expand into that big open area where that printer was. That's uh, that's essentially what we're going to do, and we're going to put a door in between there and the the uh, court's office. Just make the space a lot more usable, a lot more friendly for them to be able to do some tricks that they eat their lunch in there, you know, they do their training in there, they do, do their morning briefings in there, uh, their change order during the day with everything that happens in the court. If you've got anything to do with court, that thing is a fluid, fluid schedule and changes uh, by the hour, if not sooner than that. Uh, and it just gives them an opportunity to tell people where they need to go, where they need to be. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that happen in that room. It's kind of like a control tower at an airport. Uh, in the dictation of everything, how it needs to go. Didn't see anything on the, the entrance remodel part uh, on these drawings. I don't know if that is on there and I just couldn't determine it or? No, it's not on there. Okay. Um, it, this is just the original design that was oh. given us for that remodeling. But uh, Trish has asked that, you know, we caused a problem when we bought this new scanning equipment and it took up a lot more space than the old piece of equipment did. So uh, essentially moving that wall back and then give it, that would allow a little bit more room for people when they go through the screener. You know how we're always emptying our pockets and putting everything in the baskets and it gets run through and we need a place to put all that back on again. Uh, and that's where that would take place. Just kind of like going through TSA, just give them a little bit more room to, to do that again. And then the locker room. Uh, there's no place for people to change clothes. <laughs> so, so they would actually go downstairs to the locker room. That's like right outside where the jury meets and stuff there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a big, Open space that isn't being used. Yeah. And there are bathrooms right by them too, with like all from jury duty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we give them, uh, put up some walls, give them a door, a lock on it, so then go in and change clothes because they're going to take their uniform off and, um, you know, put their street clothes back on and leave for the day, vice versa in the morning. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, Tom, um, I wouldn't imagine this would cost a lot of money to to come up with some sort of a plan or or see the cost of, of what it would would take. I mean, to me, it, if we have you know roughly six million dollars left, one hundred forty, you know, or 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 a little bit more, seems like a no brainer. But um, you know, I just want to make sure that you know we're we're thoughtful in and how we spend the rest of uh, the ARPA money. You know, because if if we uh, get plans like this, you know, each month, you know, we're, it's going to dwindle pretty quickly. 
I want to make sure that we, you know, uh, follow some sort of uh, spending plan, you know, or some sort of budget when it comes to the to the ARPA. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, you bring up a very good point and a, certainly a concern of mine as well. And the way that uh, we had, of course, utilized the ARPA money last year was through the recommendation of the budget committee. Uh, that's still contemplated going forward. So the budget committee would still look at that as an annual appropriation. This was contemplated as a 2022 award. Um, and so uh, we, we need to look at the next year's budgets as they relate to costs and, and what the source of funding would be utilized for various projects. Uh, I, I agree with you, there's, there's 6 million okay. remaining, but that'll go pretty quickly if we don't have a coordinated plan. Uh, and we, we don't want uh, there to be sort of this piecemeal approach going forward. So we we'll, we'll wanna be attentive to that. This was in the original um, uh, awarding uh, for 2022 that was contemplated by the committee. Um, and so uh, I don't know what the dollar amount will be in, in the end in regards to the additional changes that are being proposed here. We, we would just have to get a design and kind of figure that out. Um, but yes, I share your concern and we continue, we would continue to recommend to utilize the budget committee as the committee to oversee uh, the disbursement of ARPA dollars now that they, you have allowed us in a couple board actions ago to move that to general operating. Um, that gives us more flexibility, but even creates more of an importance for us to have the budget committee oversee that. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, and I, what I'm hearing them say is that just that what they want is us to say it's okay to go ahead and come up with a dollar figure and present that to us. Is right. that what I'm hearing? Uh, mm -hmm. I had Steve walk with an engineer around it. Um, I recently asked Steve what became of that uh, walkabout, and he stated that he's just waiting for approval to move forward to get a plan made. So, Mr. Chair, that's what's on our regular agenda tonight is just not the approval of the project, but just the approval to move forward with looking at what the final cost would be for the, the, the new project since it's, it, it's growing. Okay. Correct. And, and to be clear, that would include the architectural um, work that would be required to get us that accurate bid. So some, some dollars to do that, you know, probably less than 15,000. I, I maybe look to Commissioner Lukacek on, on that, but uh, we don't think that that would be very much to, to get that. And we know the work essentially needs to be done at some point. So we don't think that would be lost work uh, in the event you chose not to approve it now, uh, but maybe in next year's budget. So we, we would recommend that. Commissioner Wood. Quoting a, a, someone who's done lots and lots of this, uh, the old administrator at the hospital. Um, these types of things are very low dollars of investment. What we're doing is we're saving staff time and making them more efficient. Mm -hmm. So with a very small capital investment, you make large investments in time efficiencies and making happier employees and more efficient employees and making more efficient processes. So I just say we go forward and do that. Um, if you want to keep it on the regular agenda, we can make a motion there. Or if we all agree, we can put it on the consent and say move forward with the contingency that it comes back to us for review and approval and how very bright architectural services on a project of this nature shouldn't be much more than in that $15,000 range. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I was going to make the same suggestion that we throw it on, on consent as long as I think, I think that we all see that this is something that needs to get done. We might as well see what it, what it's going to look like and what it's going to cost and then figure out, you know, but I think we, I think we all agree that Seven we need N. to go there. Seven in, yeah. And I don't mean you should hire me, but I think you should consider hiring older architects because they always use bigger pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> so they always bring big plans to the room. It's a lot easier to see. So hire, hire older architects. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Trish, for, for the presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, that will bring us to item six, Assistant Veteran Service Officer Discussion. Shane, would you introduce your assistant so that we all know who he is? Veteran <laughs> <laughs> Service Officer, Scotty Allen. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, 
I'm Shane Gustin, County Veteran Service Officer, and I'm here today to speak to you about um, asking your consideration for an assist full-time assistant county veteran service officer. Now, uh, the reason being, I've been in position for nearly 12 months, and I've learned a lot about what our community has for our veterans and what their needs are, as well as the operations in the office itself. And as I've done the job, I've realized that moving forward with some of the changes and some of the, the cases and claims that we're working with, I'm going to need an assistant service officer at the full-time level to continue to be productive, continue to offer the best services to our veterans that I possibly can. Let's see if I get this right. Which I'm not. So a few facts about the office. We currently have 2,967 veterans within Beltrami County. We've also had an increase of our veteran community and surviving family members coming to our office since COVID-19 um, mandates have changed and the comfort level of people coming back out into the community and coming into the office as well. We have a lot of veterans coming back. It's actually the number 16. I just had a new one yesterday. Many more they haven't had opportunity to reach yet. Coming back from recent deployments and seeking services with, with me in the office. We have the veterans home that will be in operation in 2023. And with that, the addition of 72 veterans within our community, plus the 160 plus jobs for the veterans home. And some of those may be veterans as well that are gonna be relocating and moving to our community as well. Bemidji is also being looked at as a potential center for the vet center, which is another area that will draw veterans, not only from Beltrami County, but from other areas and other counties in the Northwest sector. And that could increase the office traffic as well with people now identifying that potential things they've been dealing with for many years and now seeking the ability to come in and file a claim. Uh, Shane, what, what, what exactly is, is a vet center? A, a vet center is, is an area for veterans who are doing reintegration, reintegration coming back from a deployment, seeking um, services, whether it be marriage counseling, helping with traumatic events that they experienced while on deployment, or it could have been something that they experienced just in the community, a, a car accident, and, and they're processing that. So they go to the vet center to you know, talk with counselors and work through that. It is not the VA, it's separate from the VA. So this is an area where a lot of veterans that may not be working with the VA, they trust that facility because it's not the VA. And, but they work through this and they determine that, yes, I may have a, something I wanna to talk to the VA about, and then they come and see me and then we put them in for um, either compensation or, or try to get them to VA medical. Okay. Just identifying those, those things that they're, they're working with and see if we can get them in. The so, so these centers are, are, are staffed by, by other agencies and, and then they'll be doing some referrals to, the, to you? Correct. Okay. When, when, and I, I spoke with um, the staff member um, last week and when he talked to me, he said, when we identify that there are veterans that are experiencing certain challenges, that if they feel that it's necessary to talk to a county veteran service officer, they'll you know, give them the information and inform them on who to contact. So we can hopefully get them aligned with VA benefits at that point. Okay. There's, there's some veterans that just have a mistrust of the VA system. It, it's, it's through the years. And that is a place where they go because they feel comfortable. And once they're able to work through those challenges, then they want, they have the ability to come see me to align them with the VA. Important factors consideration. You know, how much does it cost to run the better service office? How much we provide into training just for the, the CVSO and the assistant CVSO? I'm at 150 plus hours already of, of mandatory training that I have to do. And to bring in assistant CVSO, looking at the full-time aspect, it's a good investment in the office and to them as well. Um, keep, hopefully, keep and retain that assistant CPSO for a much longer period of time. Other points of consideration. The county board has already approved a position at 75% assistant CPSO. And I'm, I'm requesting, in order to continue to provide additional outreach and good quality outreach, to have that additional percentage to a full-time assistant county veteran service officer. Uh, the reason being a lot of the outreach that we do takes you from the office. If you don't have somebody in the office to cover while the other individual is doing the outreach, you're missing veterans. Some of them might have worked up that courage to come to the door finally and you're not there. 
or the phone call isn't being answered. So having that additional person where you can flex and go outreach or be in the office, it's very important for us to continue our service. This is a comparison of CBSOs across like size uh, veteran communities. And as you can see in multiple counties, we're, we're very high in our veteran population, but most of the offices are currently running with one CBSO and an assistant CBSO in the office. Um, some also have additional staff there um, for assistance as well. Veterans outreach, and I, I, I touched on that just a little bit. Now these is Scotty Allison's numbers from some of the times that he's done uh, his outreach in the last six years. It's the amount of veteran contacts that you make when you're outside of the office, whether it be the fair or you're at one of the veteran organizations, different rallies to try and, and, and speak with veterans that haven't yet found their service to hopefully come in and visit with us. That requires a lot of time. As you can see by year, on average that is six years, you're looking at about hundred hours per year on average, just for the outreach. And I think there's gonna be a significant amount more that Scotty did prior to these reported dates. So that time out of the office, those are calls that are being missed. Those are claims that cannot be completed. It's things like that. And having that full-time staff member in there would be very beneficial. So the two options, the first one is part-time assistant CDSO, which we know is 75%, which was approved previously. And looking at the full-time assistant, as a part-time, we have reverse, reduced veteran services. We have the time it takes to get a CBSO up to speed and the amount of time we have to invest in that training. And then to not have them in the office at that same amount of time, definitely wouldn't feel that. The advantage is having the full-time CBSO. We have a more robust outreach program. We can do some changes within the office. We automate things just a little bit more because we'll have the ability to do so with additional staff, be a little bit more fluid and just be able to accomplish our duties and allow veterans an opportunity to choose a VSO or assistant VSO if they're comfortable with. And sometimes that happens, they build that relationship and they might want to prefer that veteran service officer over the other. So it's good to have that option as well. So, I'm asking your consideration for that full-time assistant county veteran service officer. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. If I could. Um, it shows on the agenda bill, it says the budget impact is 32,000. And if we're already paying full-time benefits and 75% is already budgeted, is does that mean that that, that position would be 128,000 a year with benefits? It just seems seems like a lot more budget budget impact than what I would have expected for only a twenty five percent increase. Okay. Maybe Tom might have. That's why I was just looking to Tom. <laughs> yeah. How much of that is Scotty getting? Scotty gets a finder's fee, ten percent. Well, actually, uh, Commissioner Lukacek's right about that. Uh, Scotty's. Um, decision to stay on and, and we're grateful for that um, as you know he's been with the county for some time and has a higher wage so when we did the transition plan for this year we budgeted that position at 24 hours although the county board had approved it for uh, three quarter time was was really not really sure about how much time scotty would be with the organization we, we contemplated april we're, we're still talking that through because to get a person into this position, which is the reason they're seeing you now, could take some time. And we didn't want the office to be without, uh, to be a one person show essentially. So Scotty's been very generous in working with us. Um, so those dollars for this year are a little bit different as they were budgeted because of that higher salary. So to offset that higher salary, we had to reduce the numbers that the, that the um, part-time position was going to fill to 24, just to make it work for the year in the budget. But we had contemplated at at, at uh, full time or at three quarter time, so the dollar difference now would be between the twenty four hours budgeted currently to the full time dollars that are is being recommended here, uh, because this is a proportionately benefited position. Um, those benefits ramp up as the salary ramps up too, based upon the number of hours worked. So the thirty two 
Um, thousand dollars could be less, uh, depending upon when we get that person in, should you choose to decide to go full time, uh, it would certainly be less if you said no, you want to keep it part time, then that would be a reduction. Uh, but we would have to prepare worst case scenario going forward for $32,000 in the budget, you know, from this point forward in future budgets, should you decide to do the, the full time position as being requested. Mr. Chair, yes, <clears throat> I think we already know uh, how hard it is to hire people. You know, it's all over, and if and we've had experience with different offices where we've hired part-time people, and we get them trained, and pretty soon they're gone to some other organization. So my feeling is is that we really with the showing and the keeping track of how many more vets these folks are working with, I think we need to, uh, for the sake of the vets and the new ones coming on board, uh, we need to have that two full-time positions. So that's, that's, I really believe that that would be a benefit to our veterans. Mr. Chair, I agree with uh, Commissioner um, Anderson, and I, I think that we can look at this as well as, as just sound succession planning and making sure that we're getting people into place that are that are competent and can take over if if Shane decides to leave or something or, or you know, you know, nobody is, is going to be here forever. So I, I think it'll make the office stronger. And uh, and uh, as you said, it'll help us better serve our, our growing veteran population. What's, uh, Scotty's opinion on this he's retiring <laughs> that's why i asked and then we had an argument over that and we went to the 75 percent position but here's kind of the reasons why and i would just say about that covid changed everything uh meaning that sole person in the office during covid was a pretty risky proposition for the office if I got sick, there was nobody else, right? And, but we remained open during that period because I was declared mission essential because you can't do the work from home because of the accessing of the VA automated records and the local files we have there. Uh, number two, I would say about part-time work, being as I've been doing it for a little while here, it's certainly not been optimal because I'm limiting the number of hours I can work, which forces me then to decide what projects, what appeals, what claims, what things I want to do in the two and a half hours I'm a lot, uh, two and a half days I'm allotted a week. And number three, uh, you probably didn't know this, but Shane got COVID, so he was out. And then he had another medical emergency and he was out. And therefore he wasn't in the office. So if I hadn't been there, the office would have been shut. And then you've got, uh, with, he has children in school and there was these planned and unplanned COVID shutdowns at school, once again, taking him out because he would have been the only person there. And just bringing them up to speed uh, in the office has, it was a lot more of an investment of energy, time, resources than I thought it would be. I have it in my head. I thought it would be easy to put it in that head. It, it was a little harder than that. Not because he's hard headed, but just it was difficult to transmit that knowledge. So bringing up a part time person, trying to get them to work in a part time basis, going through all that training mode. To me, it's like, yeah, you don't want to do that. Not anymore. And lastly, I mean, I know that would have, probably somebody would say in here, well, Scotty, could you st still do this job by yourself if it was just you? And I'm going to give you my ego. Yes, I could. But as I said before, I mean, COVID just changed it all. So that's my thoughts on it. And I'm thinking about, as you are, long term, if something happens to Shane, he has to go, then at least you've got somebody in there that can cover Mr. Chair, can I refresh my memory? Does everybody remember how we got to the 75% position? I think what we did is it was kind of a compromise that we said, let's give them benefits, but let's not go to a full full-time position, but let's make it more than a half-time position and do that transitioning into the first year and out of Scotty and then monitor that and see if the 70, you know, let's try it and see if it works. Is, is, does anybody else that remember right. that? Yeah. I'm running on recall yeah. here, yeah. honest. Yeah. But I, I just remember that we said, we, I thought we said we didn't want to go 100%, but we wanted to retain somebody. So make it a benefited position 
at three quarter time. That, that's what I recall. I'm 100% for veterans and I'm 100% for serving them. I'm just trying to make sure I'm consistent in my own recall and my own memory of how we got to a 75% benefited position. That's what I remember. Okay. Yeah, no, you're right. It was a compromise at that time. As you remember, I was saying, hey, mm -hmm. me, I can do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Right? But, 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 and but you were also, uh, I think also Scotty was ready to, to get out and you've extended beyond mm -hmm. what we've asked you to do. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I, I would tell you COVID helped with that. Yep. Working in that environment was not fun. Yeah. But see, that's the thing right now. Now the environment is totally different or a lot different than it was back when we were talking about it. And that was part of, of our uh, negotiations that we were doing. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think it has changed. And, and Mr. Chair, I think it's important to remember too that Scotty didn't say he could do the job himself the first day that he was on the job. It was after years, after you had your training and after you really had your sea legs that you said, yeah, you know, and, and said here after 150 hours, Shane is only meeting the minimum training, right? You know, so there's still a lot for Shane to, to, to learn. And, um, and so it's, it's not quite the, you know, we, we shouldn't expect Shane to be able to do what yeah. in his first year, what Scotty was able to do in his last year, you know, I, you know, you take an average claim, Shane's doing a claim. I mean, I can just, I'm done. You know, it's going to take Shane a little bit longer to put all the necessary paperwork together. It just does. Okay. Institutional knowledge that Scotty has. So he has done right. a very good job passing it on. It's just because of a lot. Of it it takes it. time and experience. You know, you have to. I recall and, and the brain transfer on young Frankenstein. Is it right? <laughs> so, and one of them turns out to a chicken. <laughs> so um, I know we're. we're we're pushing uh, against the clock and I, I do have a few comments. Um, you know, this is uh, the situation that, that uh, I was afraid that we would be in, um, you know, because I, I recall as well, you know, the, the compromise and, and, and Scotty, you know, assuring the board at the time that, you know, he can, he can do it himself. So, I mean, I kind of felt like we kind of pushed out Julie, you know, and, and, uh, you know, is, is there an opportunity to bring Julie back? You know, so I mean, it's kind of, kind of how I how I feel, and and uh, so you know, I'm I'm wondering how this process is different than uh, other departments that that may have um, uh, decided to to help us, you know, with 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 our budgeting and and uh, move some some positions part time. Can those departments come to us and, and say, you know, hey, can we uh, can we get this uh, part time employee back to full time or, or is that a, a budget process that we we need to, to do? Because, I mean, that's, just, you know, I, I support, you know, the work that, that you guys do. But, you know, I mean, I, I want to be fair to all the other departments as well. You know, I, I think we, we may be opening. Uh, uh, a can of worms here if, if you know if we we do something out of uh, uh, a potential budget cycle you know so i um, you know i appreciate your 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 foresight on 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 this issue but i'm i'm just kind of wondering if 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 we uh, gave it enough time to really determine you know if it's something that we needed to decide on tonight the only comment I would have, uh, Commissioner, is uh, the reference to pushing Julie out. I don't know about that, sir. Uh, at the time we were talking about that, I was clear in my site picture about what the operations of the office were. And that's why I came forth to the board about a singular person in that office. That has changed. So. I wish you hadn't said pushing out Julie or bringing back Julie or whomever you bring in. That was had nothing to do with this. Yep. Where where are we at so far? Um, maybe Tom would know this, or you guys, as far as how much we've expended. I know in, in the budget process before we've 
you know, not hired somebody until partway through the year and that's gotten us the 50% person or whatever. In this situation, we're kind of in the reverse of that to some degree because, you know, Scotty has worked some hours already this year. Um, if we were looking at already having budgeted for a three quarter time person, you know, what do we have left? Because there's going to be a, a lag in hiring time probably. And are we still going to, are we really going to use 32 grand this year? for sure or does that depend on when when we would get somebody actually hired uh great question uh commissioner goswig and so it depends on when we actually get the person into the position right because we don't pay for that until we get the person into the position um the longer it takes in this particular case the more expensive it is for us because if that if if uh Mr. Allison decides to stay in the position a little bit longer at that higher salary, then that would cost us potentially a little bit more. Could be a wash depending upon the salary, bring the new person in. So that's why we're coming to you with the sort of worst case scenario at the 32,000. We've modeled it at five months of, of earnings and also six months of earnings, kind of just depending upon when the person would come into the position. Uh, but we do know going forward, it would be about that $32,000 um, going forward because we'd have a reduction in Mr. Allison's salary, but then have to compensate for the increase in the position should it be full time. Um, I think on that same amount, you know, what we've anticipated for this year to have a no net budget increase on that $32,000, uh, the sheriff has been generous in uh, earmarking $20,000 of the $32,000 from his salary savings, uh, particularly at the jail. As you know, we've been struggling there. And then, um, and then there's another 12,000 that the HR director and I have identified that we could, um, we could earnestly commit to from salary savings from the MIS director position. Uh, so we feel like this year it would be a no net increase to budget. But going forward, we wanted the board to have eyes wide open that it, this will be a commitment of about 32,000 going forward. That covers all the benefits and the salary increase and all of that as well. So hopefully I've addressed the questions you might have had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, Mr. Chair, to clarify this, then it should say budget neutral. For this year. Um, for this decision. Right. Could for, be budget neutral. Right. For this year. Yes. Yeah. So, so. I'm good with that because I agree with the chair. We got to hold our line when we when we go into budget sessions and we do that uh, strategically and over and over we can't just change it uh, arbitrarily because it will it can potentially then have department heads coming back to us saying oh well let's do this and that so i i would say if we want to keep it on the regular agenda that we change the agenda bill to say budget neutral for this for the 2022 but knowing we all know that going forward, it's not going to be budget neutral. One thing that I was, Mr. Chair, um, is is Scotty actually going to work beyond that April, whatever it was, tenth or twentieth? <laughs> and it, it, Tom Tom kind of volunteered you to work beyond that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I'm having a lot of pressures at home, as you might imagine, my <laughs> wife. But uh, I mean. Yeah, yeah you know, I don't know how you say it without sounding kind of egotistical, but you know, the veterans are the most important thing in my, uh, as part of my professional career right now. And if it stops a get, if it's, if it's a stopgap measure so we get better for the future, it is what it is. My wife's just going to have to live with that. I'm going into work a couple of days a week. So, yes, I will. Beyond yeah, April 20th, if we haven't got. Yeah, hired exactly. I mean, like I said, but, you know, if Shane has to be gone for some reason, you know, at least he knows he's got a backstop for a while, which also allows bigger thing for him really is the fact that if I hold and stay in a job, I hold my credentials, which gives him greater access to the systems out there. Because right now he can only see what about how many of uh, about maybe 40% of the veterans files, because he's still trying to get all those stuff done with different organizations. And the day I quit is the day that it gets robbed. So. so from what I'm hearing is, is you guys um, are favoring option two over option one. Yeah. I would. Yeah. Okay.
Mr. Chair, I just want to say really quickly that, I mean, the, 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 the Scotty came to us and said, hey, I think I can do this on my own. It wasn't like there was an effort to, to, we didn't look at it, the budget committee didn't look at it, or HR didn't look at it and say, you know, we need to reduce the hours in this department. It was something that they did, and we said, well, let's take a look at it and see how it goes. And now here we are a little while later saying, well, sure, it worked for that period of time, but now we need to go back to where we were. So I don't think that this creates any kind of precedent of people then coming in, different departments coming in and saying we need to increase staff. We're just returning it back you know, to where it was. You know, uh, Commissioner Olson, I, I, I kind of disagree, you know, knowing, you know, some of some of the positions that uh, that are out in the county that that, you know, departments did. Um, are you disagreeing with my recount of how it happened? Yeah, because no. I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. Yeah, well, that, that's how it happened. But I mean, I, I, I do think that this is going to set a precedent. It only sets a precedent if we let it. We can well, say every single you know, situation. I, I think we're going to let it happen. So, I mean, I, I would more than welcome any uh, department that, that has uh, willingly uh, accepted to help us out in, in our uh, levy efforts to come forward and, and state their case on why they would like to reinstate their part-time employees back to full-time. But we have... Uh, you know, other business to, to attend to tonight, and uh, this will be on the agenda for uh, the regular meeting, item 11. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Moore, I do apologize that uh, we cut into your time, so. No problem whatsoever. Good afternoon, commissioners. And I'm here, you know, every December, the county board sets um, some of the parameters as to how the net revenues or profits are going to be distributed every year. And we always don't know exactly what those net revenues are in December, but now we've got all the books closed. And I always come back in the spring to let you see how they all were distributed. And this year it's $678,213, which I think was a little bit less than I had first forecast at about 700,000. And you can see where we're, we've dropped off quite a bit, and there's two big reasons for that. Um, our new forest management plan came out in 2018. And you can see where that's quite a drop because we're harvesting about 12% less acres per year than we were previous to that. And then also, since I've been here, we've sold about $2 million worth of land, about 200 parcels. So all those are on the tax rolls now. And so that's kind of a revenue for the county that isn't showing up in the NRM department anymore, showing up in, in taxes. So those are the two main reasons. We don't have the amount of uh, tax forfeited lands. We're just going year by year on whatever forfeits. And it's usually been about five to five to eight to 10 at the most. So that's why we're kind of going in a little bit downhill there. And you can see I'm holding the expenses down. Um, the big one in 2018, we had two trucks and we had an extra forester at that time. And that's why that's kind of up there at 700,000. And you can see where we've held it pretty tight since then about 575. And this year we dropped it down a little bit. So I'm doing everything I can to keep the bottom line healthy. And you can see the Aspen price is slowly going up. We don't know what's going to happen. We've got an auction in April. We all see what diesel's doing. We have no idea how that's going to affect our auction because anybody who purchases timber they're not going to have as much money to put into the stumpage of purchasing because it's going to have to go to fuel. So that remains to be seen. So I doubt it will go higher than that, but we'll see. You know, the world's just in a crazy state right now anyway. I don't have to tell anybody that. <laughs> um, so, you know, we always follow 28208. That's our state statute that we have to follow for our distribution every year. And in a, according to 28208, that's how things break out. $30 for every $100 in profits we make. 30 goes to county economic development and reforestation, 20 goes to the park, $20 go to county, 10 to town or city, and 20 goes to school district. And this year, the county board was very favorable towards helping us out with the for reforestation fund, and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you very much. And it was at the expense of the county development fund, but I know we walked through things and you felt that was going to work. So as you can see, the county development got about 20000 this year. And our reforestation got 176,000. That was a much needed influx of um, funds into that fund. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. Like I say, 130,000 went to the parks and that park system costs $125,000 each year to run without any vandalism, any type of fixing anything, just bare bones for plowing, toilet paper, et cetera, et cetera. 
131,000 in county general revenue, the townships and cities split up 65,000, school districts got 130,000. And I always like showing the top um, township apportionments because some of these will be in different districts. Roosevelt and Jones were kind of the big ones this year at over 5,000. You can see the other ones are all over 4,000. So for those handful of townships, I think that's a pretty good um, influx of monies into their pockets. And commissioner district, I don't put this up here to get anybody a little bit upset, but some people have more acreages and tax forfeited land and others are more cities, but you can see uh, Richard and Commissioner Anderson kind of has the bulk and, and Craig, Commissioner Gaswick has the second highest there. And then cities distribution, just to give you a little heads up on this, we end up putting a little bit back to the cities. Kellyer, for instance, was on a land sale. That's how they ended up with about $1,000, but not a heck of a lot goes to the cities, but community still gets $2,600. And then we did have a timber sale in Three Island Park this year. And those per previous county board authority, we retained those revenues and we put 14,000, for instance, it was a $20,000 timber sale. So that was our revenue earned. County Parks Fund gets 14,000 that, and we established that park reforestation fund to help with that. So 4,000 went there. And then the township always gets compensated for using their roads and such. So they got 2,000 because of that timber sale in Three Island Park. And then one last thing, just schools. Bemidji got 93,000. So that probably pays for at least one, maybe one and a half salaries in their district. And then Black Duck, lesser amounts, Kellier and Grigla. So I know you've got a big thing after me here. So I'll try to keep that moving. But if you have any questions whatsoever, I'm here to, to answer. Uh, one quick question about the school districts are, do, do they, how did they spend their money or, or do they have to follow any statute on how they? I, I believe Commissioner Sumner, it's just like the schools. We give it to the schools, we give it to the cities, we give it to the township. I don't think there's any statute that I'm aware of that kind of follows up and, and gives them guidance or okay. gives them parameters for what they have to, or how they have to spend it. Okay. Commissioner Anderson, you were on a town board. I don't think there was any no. parameters. No, it just comes in. It's going to go to roads at the townships. Yeah. Yeah. More often than not, I'm sure it is. Roads. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the townships don't even really realize that it's from the, the sales. You know, I, there's one that I contacted a couple of years ago. And said, well, I don't think we've gotten it. <laughs> so check back. Oh, yeah, they did. You, you bet. And as you know, it depends where we generate the revenue. So it does fluctuate. You know, right. some years they're going to have more timber harvesting going on in a given township and other years right. I might not have as much. So. Well, I was on the Fort Hope Town Board for 12 years and we always knew when we were going to get revenue from the Grandland Park. Um, mm -hmm. Every little bit helps at that level. Yeah, it does. Any other questions? All right. If not, thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dick. Enjoy the spring weather. Yeah. All right, redistricting discussion, item eight on the work session agenda. Tom, Jody. Good afternoon, commissioners. We are ready for the next step in the redistricting process. So bear with me as um, the first part of this presentation is going to be a few items that I've already talked about in front of the board. Um, but we'll go through them again, just in case there's someone watching on TV that hasn't heard this discussion before. So <clears throat> redistricting, the purpose of redistricting is equal representation in each voting district. Our redistricting committee in Beltrami County is County, Administ or County Administrator Tom Berry, GIS Director Kevin Trapp, and Auditor Treasurer Jody Treat, myself. Um, our plan as we go through this redistricting process was to gather options from the board. Um, we met at the last board meeting in work session and got options and direction from commissioners as to what you would like to see in the next steps going forward. We will have a public hearing two, three weeks from now at the next board meeting where citizens will be allowed to comment on whatever 
proposals that you decide to present at that public hearing. Commissioners have the uh, duty to adopt and review the commissioner's redistricting plan. You also have the your, to adopt and review the unorganized township plan. And I've talked about that a little bit the other times we've met and we'll get to that here in a few minutes as well. Um, that's those unorganized townships that do not have their own board that you act as their governing body. The redistricting schedule, the federal government collected census data all through 2020 and released that census data the fall of 21. At that point, the, the federal government went to work and got their redistricting done. The states then had their redistricting. Minnesota had a deadline of February 15th, which um, they did release the maps on February 15th. After those maps were released, then townships and cities were up next. And they take to their boards um, their redistricting maps. After towns and cities are complete, then that's where we can go in as the county and grab whole townships and whole wards to uh, compile our, our county commissioner districts. Other notable dates on here, May 17th is when filings open for all state and local offices. So our deadline of April 26th is, it, it's a hard deadline for us to get the redistricting plan adopted. At that point, we have to enter that information into the state's voter registration system so that anyone wishing to file for office will know what districts, what voting districts that they are in. State primary is August 9th and general election is November 8th. Here's, as I talked about the unorganized districts, we have three unorganized voting precincts within Beltrami County. Up in the North Gregola area, in the Washkish area, and then down in the Ten Lake area. I have put together a, so as a board acting for these, this organized town boards, um, you have to adopt a resolution and a map saying we would like the boundaries to be the same and we're going to keep the precinct the same. Each of these voting precincts is a mail ballot precinct that has the auditor treasurer's office as their poll site. So I've put together um, an agenda bill, a resolution and the maps for your consideration to, to add to your regular session coming up next. The, the state puts out statutory requirements as we go through the redistricting process. Um, the requirements are each election district boundaries, you have to adjust or review election district boundaries after every census. So every 10 years, we have to look at, is our population as equal as possible? Are our districts as compact as possible? Um, and go from there. We have to create districts that are as equal in pop population as practical. We have to create elect election districts that are compact and contiguous. So as, as tight, compact as possible, contiguous has to be um, touching on more than just the corner points. So it has to be more than just a point to become contiguous. We have to create as many commissioner districts as we have commissioners. So one commissioner can't be in charge of two commissioner districts. Our districts are bounded by precinct lines, again, contiguous territory, regular and compact, cannot vary by more than 10%. So the 10% rule is we figure out the average population per district in the county take 10% of that, figure a, a minimum population of, it happens to be 8,321, 
and a maximum population of 10,171. And the election schedule to ensure staggered terms. So that's the rotation of which commissioner districts would be up for election on which years. The board directive, so that when we met at the last meeting, the directive that we received from you is to make minimal changes, make districts more compact and with even population, ignore commissioner residences, do not gerrymander, taking all of those statutory requirements and um, guidelines that we received from you, we developed three scenarios, three proposals, um, distributed, distributing the city wards either with two commissioner districts, three commissioner districts, or four commissioner districts. Our census numbers that we received from the 2020 census, we have 46,228 people living in Beltrami County. That was a population increase of 1,786. Our average population is 9,246. And that is what's used to find our minimum, a commissioner district can be of 8,321 and the maximum that the commissioner district can be of 10,171. At this point, the city of Bemidji has not finalized their maps. So as we go forward and, and figuring the, um, where each district lies within that minimum and maximum, we are using the average population of the city of 3,089 voters or 80, a population. Um, their, my understanding of their intention is to get as close to that average as possible. If there are large deviations in what they come back with as their population per ward, that will change where you land in that minimum maximum. Excuse me, what was the number? City? 3,089. 3, okay, thank you. So our current map, this is, this is where we are right now. Um, in 2010, our average population was 8,888 voters. We had a total population of 44,442. And I caught myself again calling this voters. If I say voters, I mean population, I mean people. Um, so again, this map, it follows the guidelines of compact and contiguous. The city wards were divided amongst three commissioner districts and the, the population totals, if we, put, if we put the average city population onto this map, our highest district would be district two at 11,279, which is, 1100, 1200 people over the maximum allowed. And our smallest district would be district five at 8,043, which is approximately just under 300 people um, too low. So as we, as we go now through Proposals that, that we came up with, again, our committee met and, and put together some proposals. And once we get through all of the proposals and um, a little bit more discussion, we'll have some good a time for discussion at the end where you can talk about the different proposals. Proposal one, all the city wards are represented represented by three commissioner districts. So this is very similar to where we are right now um, with the breakout of the city wards. We had to shift in order to meet that 10% threshold, we had to shift five townships and wards um, that amounted to a population of 
2,927. City Ward split three ways in this proposal. Um, Rerunning for election would be District 2, District 3, and District 5. I'd like to add that up for rotation in 22 to start with would be Commissioner District 1 and Commissioner District 3. If there are um, the other, the reason it's relevant why we're adding which districts are required by redistricting. Once your plans are in place, you can then set the terms and the rotation of those districts that had to be rerun at that time. The two or the, in this case, the two that aren't being forced to redistrict would not, we would not be able to change those terms. So Jordy, how would that work for, for Commissioner Goswig then? If, if... I would rerun for my normal four years. Okay, okay. Just, uh, if I was being forced to redistrict, then so like, I would potentially have a two year term. Yeah. I'd be like up for grabs as to how many or what, how, what the length of my term would be. Okay, yeah, it just kind of uh, kind of threw me off because it says required yeah, by redistricting. Yeah. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, and the reason that, that we differentiate that is because of that very reason. If it's required by redistricting, then you have the option to adjust the terms. Otherwise, you do not have the option to adjust the terms. Oh, so, um, so go ahead. The wards stay the same with the, the same uh, The wards are not switched around in this particular proposal one. Correct. Okay. Proposal two, the all city wards would be represented by two commissioner districts. We were shifting 13 wards and townships with a total population in those 13 of 12,393. Um, in this proposal, all five commissioner districts would have to rerun. Proposal three has all city wards represented by four commissioner districts. Again, the township ward changes were by 10 townships and wards with a total population of 5,544. And this would require um, rerunning in districts two, three, four, and five. At the, at the board meeting, at our last board meeting, the requests or the options that you requested as a board or as individuals that we heard we wanted to see proposals for um, we had five, we heard five different options that you wanted to see. The first one would be have one commissioner with three wards and no townships. And that would be proposal one. District two would have wards one, two, and four. The second option that was requested was the city of Bemidji wards to be split among four commissioner districts. That is proposal three. District one would have ward five. District two, wards one and two. District three would have ward four. District five would have ward three. The third option was Bemidji Ward split among two commissioner districts. That's proposal two. District two would have wards one, four, and five. District five would have wards two and three. The fourth request was looking for a, a tighter group. Um, I think the comment was cleaning up the C in district three. And that is proposal one. You'll see district three used to come up and wrap around um, the north end of, or the south end maybe of district four is a good way to put it, and then make a C. So we cleaned up that C. The fifth and final request that, that we heard was one commissioner have ward one and ward two and Eccles Township. And this would be proposal three. 
except that when we pulled wards one, two, and Eccles in, we also needed to add Liberty and the city of Wilton to, to get that to come into compliance. And so that's district two receiving wards one, two, Eccles, Liberty, and Wilton. So our, our regular rotation this year are districts one and three up for election. How we calculate whether other districts have to rerun is it's called the 5% rule. So we take our average population of 9,246 and multiply that by 5% and we get 462 population. So if you have, if you have our, and our population shift consists of the population shifting in plus the population shifting out. So in order to, to fall under that 5% rule, the district, the number of, population shifting into the district plus that number of population shifting out has to be under that total of 462. So the opportunity to change here, here again is where I talked about, we have to keep the rotation of two commissioner districts up for election one year, three commissioner districts up for election the next election but any of those districts that are re required to rerun because of redistricting, we can, you can work with their term. That could be a two-year term or a four-year term, as long as that rotation stays two and three. So our goals for today, our first goal is to affirm the reorganization of the, or the unorganized townships voting precincts. So that is the agenda bill resolution and map that I just handed out earlier. Um, and so what I'm asking is as a requirement of the board that you either through move to your consent agenda or the regular meeting, the uh, reaffirming of those district boundaries are not changing and the voting precincts are not changing. So that would be outcome one that we need today. So you, okay, just so I understand that, affirming the unorganized voting precincts and what else? So that's, that's what I would like us to do right now. And then we'll go on to identifying which proposals that you want to present at the public hearing. There's nothing changing on the unorganized townships. It's, you know, the one Correct. in my area and the other ones are in Tim's area, and they're staying the same. So I would I would just move that we put this on consent. Yeah. I, I would agree with Commissioner Gosvick. I doubt that the populations have, have changed a whole lot. Not. I mean otherwise otherwise you would have had other they're they're small populations, yeah. I be, believe yeah. 33 in each of the northern precincts and 200 ish in in the one in district five, one. Okay, so I'll be seven. This easy, right? Yes. I will be seven zero on the yeah. on the consent. Thank you. So the other outcome that we need from this meeting is we do have the public hearing set, I believe, has it been advertised? It's been advertised. It's set for the first meeting in April to give you time um, if you want to discuss things that come up at the public hearing, and then you can adopt at whatever you decide on at the, the next um, board meeting in April. When we went through um, and put the proposals together for the, the options, the five different options that were requested from the last board meeting, we sent those out to you. 
we received back some questions and comments. So, and some, so in order to answer those questions and comments, we did put together some informational maps and different scenarios to try to answer those questions. And I believe that, that you've all seen those as well. So the goal for today, the second goal for today is to identify which of the maps that you would like presented at the public hearing that we have up coming up. So before we do that, I, I just wanna um, get a little clarification. We're still waiting on the city of Bemidji to publish their maps and, and, and what they publish could alter what we do here at the county with our maps. We are right now we're using city average. Okay. And so in concept, in theory, these maps would not change. Okay. In final numbers, they most definitely will change, but um, we are under a time frame where we need to get some concepts out to you so that you can have those discussions and still in a timely manner approve whatever the county redistricts to by that April 26 deadline. Well, personally, you know, I, I um, you know, thank, thank the committee for, for the job that you guys have done uh, uh, doing the maps. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't an easy task. Um, and I would support uh, the three proposals that the committee has uh, brought forward um, as, uh, as the maps to present at the at the public hearing. If if you need one, I, you know, I, I guess uh, I'd, I'd base that decision on on you know, I guess the limited discussion that we could have tonight. At the last meeting, we got proposal one, two, three uh, via a message. I believe to all five commissioners, we got four, five, six. I didn't see six today. That's correct. At the last meeting, actually, we didn't have proposals put together. At the last meeting, we gathered the ideas that you request that you as commissioners were looking for. So that's what those five requests were. And we went back with those five different scenarios and um, using the state's guidelines and what you requested, we came up with the three options that best align with all of to stay in compliance. Um, so those were put together after the, the previous board meeting off of direction at the board meeting. Then those three maps, those three proposals were sent out. The, um, we did receive questions and comments. Those questions were addressed in an additional set of informational maps to show how those questions would be answered. Why was number six that was sent to us not presented? It was an informational map to answer questions that came up. Um, if it's something that you want to discuss amongst commissioners, that's we can definitely do that. You can definitely. To be clear, we haven't looked at four, five, or six today. Right. Correct. We've just looked at one, two, and three. Right. Right. Because four, five, and six were sent to each of us. Right. Yeah, I, I don't understand why. Yeah, I don't understand why four, five, and six were made. I don't understand why they were sent out yesterday. Um, were they sent out at the, were they made to, to satisfy the, the request of a single commissioner or because we had a discussion and then you guys came out with the maps and I thought that today we were going to discuss the, the proposals, the, the three proposals that came out on Friday and then, and then give you more direction or, or not or accept them or, or whatever. But I was, I was really surprised to see you guys come out with three more last night because I surely had no direction to staff about changing any maps and I'm not sure how that happened. Mr. Chair, um, we developed those three proposals, the four, five and six, which haven't been presented today as information to answer questions and address comments that were produced. They don't align with the board's original direction 
that was provided to us. So that's why we didn't provide them today in the formal presentation, but we did provide them to the board so that you could see in response to those questions and comments, what the results would be on the maps. So the redistricting committee um, to acknowledge and affirm the direction that the board gave us at the last uh, workshop or work session on March 1st, presented only the first three maps, which is what was originally pre presented to you uh, for your consideration, I wanna say Friday. The purpose of this discussion is that there are a lot of ways of satisfying the redistricting question. A lot of ways. And I thought we were still at a point of presenting us with alternatives so that we can look at them and review them and agree up as a county board, which is the best solution for redistricting. Right. <clears throat> I thought we were still in the discussion phase. I didn't think we'd limited it down to three proposals from the last meeting and just fine tune those. So I, I thought we were still thinking about options. There's many different ways of doing this. There's many different ways. Uh, Commissioner Lukachika, you know, I, I agree that there, there are, um, you know, that we, we, you know, discuss this, and 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 you're correct. There are many different ways. You know, um, there there was uh, three different uh, set of maps provided, um, as as you know, uh, as there were questions, you know, about the three proposals. So if if you think about it, if we all had you know, uh, three different maps that we would like, you know, that that kind of that kind of bothers me because that that to me i, I want to be i, I don't want to interfere with the process of of of, of kind of telling how the committee to to make make the maps um i want to avoid that i think you know that was uh, the direction that the the committee was was going and uh you know looking at the the three additional proposals i mean it just uh you're almost creating that C thing that we're trying to trying to avoid. Um, looking at the the three additional proposals, I'm, I'm all for discussing, you know, and and that's why I think it's important that we have a public hearing, and uh, uh, you know, we we have to make a decision tonight in order to uh, come with something, you know, come come to the public hearing with something. Um, that those are my thoughts. Yeah. It's not the committee's decision. No. It's the county board's decision. We're asking for as many possibilities to find out which redistricting map truly meets as many of the criteria as possible. So it's not the committee's task to bring the right map to us. We have asked the committee to bring as many possibilities of how to solve the problem within the parameters and the criteria that are set forward by state statute. And ultimately it will be the county board's decision to vote on which redistricting proposal is the right direction forward. Yeah, and I, and I for one want to see as many possibilities because there are a lot of different possibilities. So I'm not going to limit it to one or two or three maps that they bring out uh, right out of the chute because mm -hmm. we haven't looked at the other thing. So I, I, I don't think anybody asked for more maps. The last meeting, we saw three proposals and we said, we gave the, the committee the direction to give us more information. That's mm -hmm. what I heard coming out of that last meeting. We want more information. And I, for one, want more information. Mr. Chair, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to sort out. So I'm, uh, I was a bit confused this morning when I looked online and saw four, five, and six. I didn't know that there was going to be. I, my wife is sick and some things are going on in the household. So I did not check it out. 
And so I was surprised to see four, five, and six. I thought our options then were going to be uh, one, two, and three. So right now, I, I've i tried to go, I mean, I've gone through them and was not sure which wards went to which ones. Uh, uh, but I was much more comfortable with uh, one, two, and three from the standpoint that I had time to ask questions and, and look at them. And Mr. Chair, I was not comfortable with one, two, and three. So I didn't tell anybody. I just wanted to see what comes to this meeting and how we move forward from there. So what were the, Mr. Chair, and I'm sorry, um, we, we, we just don't have enough time to give this proper discussion right now. You know, we got crammed at the end of this work session and that's, that's because I, I, would, like to, I would like to understand what, what the, what, these other maps, what, what are they, what were the reasons or what are the, what are the goals that they're trying to accomplish? There's just other ways to skin the cat. Yep. They're just and, but, but based on change. what, Why I mean, we just bring all of the, the maps that you put together to the public hearing. Well, and you know, and, and, the, public exactly. and the, the thing with that though, is, I mean, we haven't had a chance and opportunity to, to submit our, our own, our own maps, if you will. I, and, well, and nor should we. I mean, the, yeah. the role is not for us to draw our own maps that we think and, look the best I, to us. And that's why, that's why I'm, I'm leaning on, on the, the committee, you know, to bring that information to us. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get involved with, with drawing my own boundaries. You know, I mean, I, I think that's a border, borderline, you know, politics. Well, Mr. Chair, you know? They, they have come up with six maps at this point. Well, so but, but that's not just bring the six to the public for the public to weigh in. Well, on you know, but, design, but which one those six we like? But, we, but we could have, the, you know, I, I, I would like that opportunity as well. I mean, if, if we're going to bring six, you know, why not bring three that, that I choose or, or direct them to, to, to make up to, to benefit me? You know, they, they did the maps. Well, I'm they just did. saying, you, you're saying bring, bring all six. Well, you know, Bring fifteen more. We don't have well, so, exactly. Yeah. So we we need to make a decision tonight. That's what I'm saying. We've got six at this point. Let's just bring all six. And I, I'm and more in so I'm I'm more in support of of the three that the committee uh, uh, proposed to the county board. It it seems to me, Mr. Chair, and I don't know this, but it seems to me that these maps were made in response to a minority of the board expressing their interest or their their opinions and and their wishes. I, otherwise, I don't know why these maps got made. It wasn't that they should, if they were going to be made, they should have been made at the direction of the of the of the whole of us, and not just at, uh, one or two people outside of meetings uh, pressuring staff or or asking staff to come up with new maps. And maybe yeah. pressure isn't the right word. Um, we asked for more information at the last meeting. Very clear. These these the three maps that we that, that were presented today. They were. Am I wrong? They were they were put out on Friday. We didn't look at them in a, in a previous meeting. This is the first time we've looked at these maps as a board that the, that the committee proposed to us. So I, I just, I, I think that something happened between Friday and yesterday Monday. afternoon that I wasn't part of. There was a discussion that occurred that the board wasn't part of, the whole board. And now there's three new maps in response to whatever that discussion was. Am I, am I wrong? There was no discussion we wanted more information from the last meeting. That was it. Who's the we? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not following you. you. For some reason, you were in favor of the last meeting and the, and the three maps that came forward. I, I, you know, I was not in favor of all three maps and said, we want to see more possibilities of how to solve the redistricting problem within the criteria that are set forth in the state statute. But Commissioner Lukacek, this is the first time that as a board, we have looked at, at any of these maps. We didn't look at the first three maps at a different meeting. Uh, last meeting they only we, just came out on Friday. The last meeting, we just gave the direction to the committee right. to, to develop maps, so, not, not so I mean, now, this is the first time that I've seen them. So now we're asked to act on only those three maps? What I am saying is that- And I'm, I'm opposed to that. What I am saying is that staff was not directed there. The staff came out with the three maps that they came out or the committee rather came out with the three maps that they came out with on Friday. 
I looked at the maps on Friday. Via a text message, email message An email. to the yes. five county commission. Right. And so then now I then then yesterday, late yesterday afternoon, three more maps came out. We didn't we didn't as a board go to the committee, but I it sounds like someone did and said Nobody I don't Nobody directed the committee to make more maps. That's okay, what I'm why, asking. So why why are there why more those maps three then? maps came out? Yeah, because they I, weren't part of the original maps that came out on on Friday. That's 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 my disconnect here that I would like to understand. And, and we're a total of three days after seeing the first actual maps of what the redistricting was going to look like. Right. And now we're in a county board meeting saying that we're going to go with one of those three or present those three to the general. No, public. I'm opposed to that. Well, Mr. Chair, that discussion is supposed to happen here, yeah. not. Not, not, not through phone calls when the rest of the board isn't privy to the conversation. There were no phone calls. So how did the maps come available? Or, uh, Tom, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we can shed more light on this, but I think it's going to take a little bit more time. And I just want to be reflective of uh, where we are in the schedule. So what my recommendation would be to the board is to add this discussion onto the regular session because we would like some direction as regard to what maps to produce for the community in uh, in regard to the hearing that's coming up at our next meeting. So if uh, it, with your permission, if we if you'd like to do that, I think that would give you the time and space you'd need to have a more robust conversation. We can get directly into those questions and answers and and then hopefully get to, you know, what the resolution will be. You're speaking of tonight. Correct. What are we uh, we can we can uh, move 10 down to the assistant veteran service officer position and number 11 would be uh, what do we call it? redistricting discussion discussion okay all right so with, with that um also, the administrator's update will be item 12. Administrator's update. Yep. And seeing no other changes, we'll uh, adjourn for a couple of minute break and, and be back in uh, five minutes. Yes, one oh, session or special. City is meeting on Friday for a special work session. Just spend, you know, trying to get it for 35 minutes, is it? And I knew that was going to happen. Yeah, yeah.
Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioner Olson, can you uh, recite the pledge, please? <laughs> All right, general comments from the board chair. Um, it, you know, I, I think at this point, I think it's pretty exciting to see uh, that we have a crowd tonight. You know, welcome everybody. Um, I, I think it's always uh, good to see, you know, uh, our citizens you know, uh, participating in, in the process. So, so welcome. Um, citizens addressing the board, uh, anyone wishing to address the county board? Uh, on an item not on the agenda may come forward at this time to be recognized by the board chair. Please state your name and address for the record. Comments are limited to five minutes. A personnel complaint against an individual county employee may not be heard initially at a board meeting. Personnel complaints may be submitted to the board in writing through the county administrator's office. A person addressing the board may not use profanity or vulgar language. And I also want to mention that uh, uh, there is a public hearing um, scheduled on the regular agenda. Um, so if you are here for the public hearing, we will have uh, we will ask you to wait until the the hearing is open. So now I would recognize anybody um, I would like to approach on an item not on the agenda. Greetings, commissioners. My name is Robin Dwight. I'm from Waskish, Minnesota, and I am the president of the Upper Red Lake Area Association. And I'm also the spokesperson for the Keep It Clean Upper Lower Red Lake Committee. Our committee is tackling the problem of human waste, trash, and garbage removal, collection, and hauling out of the Upper Red Lake surface, shoreline, and area during the winter fishing season. Local businesses and individual landowners are handling the waste of over 85,000 overnight visitors to the lake in the 2021 winter fishing season and 78,000 in the 2021-2022 winter fishing season, according to Minnesota DNR. I have received many reports of human waste of all types, including raw sewage being left on the ice for others to deal with. Various reasons include it gets hidden in the snow, it freezes to the ice, it blows away, there's nowhere to take it, there are no dump stations for my wheelhouse, and I don't wanna pay resorts to take my trash. Many people ask why folks aren't fined for acting badly. It appears that unless they are caught in the act, it is nearly impossible for conservation officers to hold offenders accountable. If folks are found to be leaving trash and bags with human waste behind them, they can receive a $25 fine to my understanding. This does not seem to be a deterrent and does not do much to prevent the illegal dumping of sewage, be it in toilet bags or from discharging the holding tanks of RV styled wheelhouses. We need to change the way we address this problem to keep up with the growing numbers of fisher people enjoying this valuable resource. One way would be to review the county ordinances in place and include language which would enable our conservation officers and county law enforcement officers to enforce all kinds of littering. One solid waste ordinance that seems very relevant is section three, storage and collection 3.2, storage. Our committee believes that persons on the frozen lake must contain all of their food and or in their property, be it wheelhouses or vehicles. Another problem area is with the commercial site service charges and registration sections four and five. It has been reported to us that there may be commercial sites on Upper Red Lake that have not registered with Beltrami County solid waste and therefore are not up to date on their responsibilities and the responsibilities of their customers with regard to disposing of their waste in required facilities. We would like folks to know what their roles are and we would like the Beltrami County Sheriff's Department to monitor their behavior as we begin a pilot project to help do a better job of keeping it clean. 
We need language for non-compliance to make offenders subject to enforcement and penalty. I am representing the Keep It Clean Committee at this forum to briefly share our concerns and wishes. I hope this will lead to a broader work group discussion about effective regulation and enforcement in the coming winter fishing season. And I want to mention that we've also had multiple meetings with local and regional stakeholders to pinpoint the problem and come up with short term and long range solutions. You can reach me at the number I provided on your emails. If you have any other questions or concerns, I'd be happy to answer any questions I could. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. Uh, my name is Christy Norland. I live in um, Laporte. I work in Bemidji. And I have come forward as on behalf of the Beltrami County Farm Bureau. We would like to bring forward um, national or a request for an, a National Agriculture Week proclamation. So I have some facts that I would like to read. There are more than 2 million farm families throughout America. There are close to 70,000 farm families in Minnesota. There are close to or almost 600 farm families in Beltrami County. Minnesota ranks fifth in the nation for agricultural production by sales. American agriculture not only feeds America, but also contributes $164 billion in agricultural exports worldwide. Beltrami County has 170,000 acres of farmland. Beltrami County has about 16,000 beef cattle total. They have, uh, Beltrami County has over 2,000 sheep and lambs. Beltrami County has, I'm gonna get, estimate this number, about 6,000 chickens. That's the meat type chickens, that's the chickens who are laying eggs and the young chickens, uh, female chickens who are just starting. And they're called pullets, by the way, just mm -hmm. for a learning name. In Beltrami County, um, the agriculture and related industry supported a little over 2000 jobs in the year 2020, 1,127 of them, seven of them were forestry, 899 were livestock, 155 were crops. Um, the generation of um, agriculture and related industries total an estimated $399 million. And the, some Beltrami County quick facts, the number of farm operations, 583 farms. The average farm size was 289 acres. The market value of those crops on those farms was $13.3 million. And the market value of livestock on those farms was $10.5 million. And I don't, know how I'm supposed to do this proclamation. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to read it or present it to the board. Mr. Chair, when it comes to the agenda, I was planning on asking to add this to the agenda to um, create this, to, to uh, pass a resolution of support for this proclamation. And then the chair would read it uh, if were it to get passed, which it probably has a good chance of doing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I think- Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, you, Christy. Uh, I, I appreciate that. It's interesting facts about uh, Beltrami County. 
We thought we were just about logging. <laughs> So are there any other citizens wishing to address the board on an issue not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, with these changes uh, on the consent agenda, bailiff office expansion project for 7N, 7-0, affirm the unorganized voting process, a precinct. 7-P, uh, a court settlement that was discussed in a closed session. It's court file number 04-CV-203489. 20, For the regular agenda, leave the public hearing on for eight. Swearing the new sheriff deputy for nine. Ken, uh, assistant veteran service officer position. 11, redistricting discussion. Uh, 12, administrators update. Did I hear there was going to be another? And if I could make a friendly amendment, would you would you put the 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 National Agriculture Week proclamation before redistricting? Because I think that then that's just going to be a, a probably a longer discussion, and this should be really quick. Thank you. Thank you. Proclamation. Uh, is that okay with everyone? Yeah. All right. With that, Mr. Chair, I move the agenda. All right. So we got a second by Commissioner Anderson. Is uh, a motion by Commissioner Anderson? Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Second by Commissioner Olson. Any further discussion? Being none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, motion for approval of the consent agenda. I'll make a motion we approve the consent agenda. A motion by Commissioner Gosberg. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Lukacic. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right, so that will bring us to the regular agenda. Um, we'll just open the hearing uh, for the proposed short-term rental ordinance. Brent? Thank you, commissioners. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Brent Root, I'm the Director of Environmental Services here in Mill County. County. Um, the, the reason we're here tonight is there's a public hearing scheduled, and I just want to preface the public hearing by saying, for those that maybe aren't aware, um, the county kind of started getting into this process of establishing or creating this ordinance. Um, sometime in like July was when the first people started coming to the county board meetings and expressing their concerns about short-term rentals in their neighborhoods. and uh, you know, from there, kind of worked into creating an ordinance to regulate these um, short-term rentals. Um, like as you guys know, they're they're not they were never regulated here in Beltrami County. They're not regulated in a lot of counties. It doesn't mean they're allowed. Um, there's Shoreland ordinances that simply they say that unless it's in the use table, it's not allowed. Well, there's a lot of things that just go unnoticed, unregulated, um, but. As these get more and more popular, the commission's boards are forced to deal with these things and decide how they go. And so the decision that was made at the planning commission level and, um, and the kind of direction from the board or loose direction from the board at the beginning stages was, um, you know, it's probably the right time to consider an ordinance. And if we're gonna have regulations, let's not go too far and overreact. Let's create something that protects this private property right or creates this private property right but also protects the neighborhoods and the people that have to live around these and live with them and so I uh, just wanted to start by saying that's that's the intent um, it's, a, it's a really short ordinance as far as ordinances go and uh, I've talked to quite a few people over the last well couple of months um, public and and uh, it, it's very interesting to me to talk to these people because most of them are, are short-term rentals that I didn't know existed. Um, 
when you go look on some of these popular sites, it's tough to really say how many short-term rentals are in Beltrami County. Um, some are up, they're down, they're not available for a few weeks. And so if you're, if you're not searching for dates of available stay that, that match when occupancies are available, it's, it's kind of hard to pin some of those down the numbers. But um, over the last couple of months, the best we can estimate is that there are probably a, getting close to 50 of these outside of the city of Bemidji and Northern Township that are still within Beltrami County. So it's not an insignificant number and it's not several hundred, but um, just put it all in context. And uh, if that's, unless anybody has any questions to, before we start gathering public input on it, I'll move aside and let the public weigh in. Questions? Let me ask you a question. Yeah, there's a question you wanted to ask. <laughs> If you want to come forward and. Well, I was going to ask a friend a question at all. And uh, as far as ordinance. Do you need a motion to? Short of the ordinance. I think They have been unrated. Yeah. So if it's not in there, they need to have it. So it could have been. So it could have been. Long time. Yeah. Uh, we we still have to open the public hearing. Yeah. Was there a motion to to open the so public? You just you can do it. Oh, you can do it. Well, yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> open the public. Hearing. So I'll open the public hearing. So if, if you can please uh, state your your name for the for the record. Sure. I'm Bruce Schumann. Uh, I'm up in Pines, Minnesota, on Black Duck Lake. And I've got a copy of the the short term rental ordinance with me. And, you know, when you start looking through this, you know, the, I guess, B, it talks about proposed intent and objective, and it's got quality of life surrounding the surrounding properties, which is, to me, it's pretty important. You don't want to be a nuisance to your neighbor. And in three, it says preserving the residential integrity of the neighborhood. So where we're located up in Heinz, in like most neighborhoods, I mean, we're single family homes. We're not multifamily homes, we're not you know, that type of thing. So that area now is a multifamily because of the 22 number that's been designated for that property that's right next to me. The one we've been talking about, I've been here several times. So going through this ordinance, if you look at like C definitions, short-term rental units, this is just a few suggestions for you guys to consider when you're if you guys have the power to do pretty much any changes you want. But a number four is the short-term rental units means any home, cabin, condominium, similar building. Could that be just one? So they can't have like three trailers on one lot and say, okay, I've got you know, nine, 10 beds here now. If you see what I'm talking about there is just a single building. Not just one, not several. I mean, that would be one of my suggestions. The next one would be the type of STR. You have A, B, and C. And actually there's a D when you look in the back here, as far as occupancy goes, because that one's on the D, it's got owner-occupied residential structure with one room space, three guests. My suggestion would be that would be the A as far as STR type A. B would be what the A is currently, and that's a short-term rental unit, short-term rental unit having up to three bedrooms and having a maximum occupancy of eight people. Once you get over eight, you're not single family. And usually at eight, you're gonna have a couple of families in there. We just had an incident two weeks ago, eight guys show up. Okay, eight guys in the wintertime usually isn't too bad, but they're fishing. They've got the four wheelers and snowmobiles going in and out. There's beer cans or urinating out in the yard, that kind of thing. It all depends on the people you have when we start talking about quantity. Because eight, when you've got three or four kids and a couple of adults, you know, that number is manageable. You get eight guys together, now it's a little more unmanageable. And there's no one there to monitor anything. 
that's the other. And then the C type, I would say, the C type would be a short term rental unit having a maximum occupancy or eight or more people. Because once you get over eight, I mean, when you talk about 13 on here, you need to have on site people for that. I mean, there's no regulation. And the neighbors that are there, we shouldn't have to be monitoring these people constantly, which is what we have to do. I mean, that's it's something that's a responsibility we don't want. You know, I mean, if we're going to do that, you might as well deputize every one of us and just send us a paycheck. We'll start watching the property then. But we shouldn't have to do that. I mean, if you have a neighbor, you talk to them, you can get it straightened out. But when you have that person gone in a week, the next guy comes in, you got to go through the same thing with them. Nobody's going over the rules with these people. If they do, they go over with one person, the first one that shows up, and then they're gone. Going through the, I don't know if you guys have this up there or not, but it's section E, land use. And it says all existing short-term rental operations as of enactment date of this ordinance shall apply and obtain a use permit 90 days from the state. Does it have to be 90 days? That means I've got another summer of this stuff that's gonna be happening. I mean, I know Bemidji actually did a, a moratorium on them and shut them down. I don't know, was there any lawsuit filed? Can anybody, does anyone know? I mean, could you just shut them down and say, okay, once you have the permit, then you can start going within 30 days. And then under this one, it's got occupancy, it's got kids under three don't count. I don't know why. I mean, that's something I would strike out of there because there's still another person or the body that's gonna be there. In a three-year-old, we had one out in the swing that just screamed like the entire afternoon. I mean, if you don't count him, you know, trust me, he needs to be counted. And as far as parking goes, in Beltra or Bemidji, they have it where you have to have a site diagram with parking where it's gonna be that type of thing, which is a good idea, especially one that has the amount of people that's next door to us, because parking, there's vehicles there and then they all bring trailers. I mean, the, three weeks ago, we had snowmobilers in there and they had 16 snowmobiles show up. So they had three huge trailers that they're unloading snowmobiles with. They're not supposed to be driving in the yard, supposedly, but. They were in our yard and got stuck out by the mailbox. And the point is, you know, we've had enough of I'm sorry's from the owners and that type of thing. I don't want to hear another I'm sorry. I'm, I've had it up to here with those. You know, there's got to be some sort of action. And I'm hoping that's what this is going to be. And as far as infractions go, I'm hoping that we have something set up. Brent had talked about having an online form where we can control this, put in our complaints. I know the manager for that property is more than 30 minutes away, so they might have to get someone else. And if we call, it can't be a phone call. It's if somebody has to physically show up within 30 minutes would be ideal, and that's what this states. If it's over 30 minutes, I imagine that would be another incident against that property as well. But that's what I'm looking at, hoping to get out of this is all. It, yeah, I'm a little selfish because I live right next to this and have for two years. So there's there's a reason for it. Thank you, Thank you Bruce. Mm -hmm. I also want to remind that uh, remind the, the public that uh, the, the, the same rules that apply to the to the regular meeting about the uh, comments and, and, and concerns um, apply to to the public hearing as well so um, thank you hey, my name is Michelle Tuft I live on Power Dam Road um, my husband still uh, we have run an Airbnb at our property for five years, I want to say. And we also have a service called Furnished Binder. 
where we host doctors and nurses and pharmacy tech students and IT um, people who need a furnished apartment for a length of time. So uh, they may come for a week or they may come for a year. Uh, my friend Alyssa here has one and she had a uh, furnished finder for a year. Um, quietest, best tenant ever. Um, I just wanna say, um, speaking for the Airbnb hosts and hostesses that are here, I, I don't know how many are here um, that are in my camp, we certainly do not want this type of scenario. This would break my heart. If I had a lake cabin and someone came in with 16 snowmobiles, I'd be mad too. I'd be upset because you buy a lake cabin so you can have some peace and quiet with your family, you know? So um, I just wanna say that I am not here to, to, um, to say, please don't do any of this. Let us do our thing. I mean, obviously, yes, I, I want that, but I get it, what he's saying, I get that. And, um, but we live on our property. And if we don't, which we may, may not in the future, we have a caretaker on our property that is there to manage any kind of complaint or problem or water heater issue or whatever might you know show up. Um, I forgot to bring it, but I have a book, I have a book and a half now of notes from our guests just thanking us for the hospitality. They can't get a hotel room because it's full, booked all the way to Walker. They find us. They have a place where their baby can sleep because it's quiet. Um, they have a place where they can bring their five kids and not be harassed with hotel noise. Um, I have a doctor in there right now who is working at Sanford for a month and he's lovely and he loves it because it's quiet, you know? So this is my husband and my retirement plan, you know, hospitality. Um, from what I understood about the ordinances, if it, I, and I'm really sorry if I'm wrong. I thought if it wasn't out there that that was okay for us to 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 have the Airbnb because I did comb the books and I even printed it and have it on my computer and there was nothing about it. So I thought, well, okay, when we do it right and we do it well, um, we're good. So um, about the ordinance that I received um, from Reed, thank you, Reed. I mostly just have clarification questions, honestly. Um, and I don't know if that's something I would do here. I might do it with Mr. Anderson, who's our part of, uh, Actually, we're in your district or whatever that means. But, yeah. But I, I think clarification here would help other folks as well. Okay, they're kind of detailed. Is that, is that? So it depends on Brent. Uh, I mean, how, how do you want I, it? Because I don't want to come back to your yeah, that's, that's fine with me. It's entirely up to the board. And, and, you know, I want to be mindful of, of, of everybody else's comments, so. Yeah, um, exactly. I'd be happy to just talk about that. I, I think you need to get your feedback back okay. to Brent and his committee, because that's where they're going to have to process it and yep. come to the board again, correct, Brent? Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I'm like you, I see the value in having that conversation with all the phone calls that I've received. But then we'll be questioning about how to apply it again. Mm -hmm. but probably is helpful to you, but okay. at the time. Yeah. Well, I think we're having a public hearing, yeah. so some. Mr. Chair, would you just clarify with everybody that we aren't voting on this tonight? Yeah. We aren't going to take action tonight. We're taking input. <clears throat> we want to listen. We want to hear. Right. Yes, right. correct. Uh, the public hearing is just part of the process, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is. Uh, the final draft before the final draft, if you will. Right, right. <laughs> yes, so. Mr. Chair, I mean, generally in a public hearing, we're taking testimony, we're not having a dialogue. So, it, and, and if if everybody is gonna take five to eight minutes to speak or more because they wanna ask questions and have them answered, this is gonna be a very long, yeah. not that the questions aren't important, but I, you know, I, I, I would say that if we can hear your, hear your comments and your concerns and then specific questions, direct either to your commissioner or to uh, Brent and um, and it will come back to the full it will get discussed by the commission and then and by the planning commission and then by the board yeah it's been a long day I really don't want to go into all of it tonight but I just want to say as an Airbnb -er who tries to respect my neighbors that I'm so sorry that you guys had to go through this 
that stinks. And, uh, and we strive to have a, a quiet place where people can come and rest and leave refreshed. So, um, and, and make a little retirement on top of it, if we can. So, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening. My name is Muriel Gilman, and I live in Northern Township. And I do not have an Airbnb next door. Um, I do own a short-term rental in another state in a mountain town. And um, I get their newspaper, it's Jackson Hole, Jackson, Wyoming. And there's there are lots of discussions going on in the mountain towns about the short-term rentals. And I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't read the ordinance. I, um, I apologize for that. I just, what I, the main message I want to share with you from living in that environment or visiting that environment and um, reading the articles about the short-term rentals is if there are only 50 in Beltrami County right now as someone um, <clears throat> surmise, you're lucky. And um, if, you're, if you're putting a number on it, err on the side of conservative, because once you open up Pandora's box, it becomes very difficult to regulate it. And I, I appreciate both sides that I've heard, and um, they do serve a very useful purpose. It's been good for us financially to have a short-term rental in Jackson Hole. But um, when we're there, we always love having our owner neighbors there. And when we have renters, not always, but periodically we have nightmares. And, and so they, do, they can create problems. And my advice is err on the side of being conservative. If you're putting a number on the number that, putting a, a max on the number that can be available in Beltrami County, then err on the conservative side. If it isn't in the ordinance, I would suggest doing um, more research and I can share some of that with my commissioner, Lukacic, um, that some are doing a percent of the number of um, households. There are different ways that different communities are doing it. So those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Are there any other comments? <laughs> I'm Mike Cause. I live at 17492 Grassy Island Lane in Hines. And I'll try to make this brief. I've <clears throat> I have a couple concerns. One is I've read the, the uh, draft ordinance and I'm a little concerned about RVs. It is mentioned in there that they can't be in addition to, but I would hope that there'd be some language to include how they will, would be addressed in an undeveloped lot, meaning you know, if somebody buys five of them and puts them on a lot, they're going to rent them all out. And I don't see any language to that effect. The other one is, uh, another one is, it's a little hazy to me, but there should be a physical presence within 30 minutes. And if that physical presence of a complaint, if that physical presence on site isn't there, that should be considered a violation of the regulation. In addition to the violation, if it's proved to be a violation. So there could be two violations happening with the same incident. The other, and 
I can talk to Brent afterwards. I'm not quite sure how the short-term rental fee interim permit process works. It just mentions there is one, but it doesn't mention anything about it other than it's a requirement for type C. Sounds like it has to come before the board, or I mean, before the planning commission or the board of adjustment. Anyway, I'd like to look a little more in depth specifics on that. Uh, when it comes to the operational guidelines and rules, I would like to have them available to the adjacent landowners upon their request so we know what the rules are. In my current situation, I have to, one of the rules is they shouldn't trespass on my property, but that should be written in the rules someplace. That, you know, those are lawful violations. And many times all you hear about is the behavioral regulation, meaning no, no noise and loud. But there are other regulations that I feel would not occur if those people weren't there. They don't trespass on my property if there isn't anybody at the RV and RBO or whatever it is. So there should be some language to that effect. Uh, I live on a lake, so therefore I would like to see maybe a little bit uh, shorter period or septic compliance check. If you get a type short term type B, the renewal is eight years. And I would hope there's only one compliance check on the original, and then it just that would be nine years without a compliance check. I would, I would hope that they could shorten that window and maybe demand one every five years. I think somebody comes to visit my property to assess my property taxes every five years. Maybe a, a septic compliance in five years wouldn't be too bad, out, outrageous. Uh, the other question I have is, is the trespass issue. I, local enforcement could be involved. I, I could certainly call it. It takes upon my effort to post it, which I really don't want to do with my neighbors. Either, you know, and if people would maybe would ask me, I, I'd consider it, but they don't ask. They just trespass. So the question is, is the air, the owners of the short-term rent, are the owners of the short-term rental responsible for the behavior of trespass on my property? To some degree, I'm not, you know, they aren't doing the trespass, but they are having the people present that are doing the trespass. And the last one is, Grassy Island Lane, about every five years, the road becomes questionable right about this time of year for rutting, mud. And if you bring in some late entries there that really don't have too much concern other than getting out one week later, I'm just concerned that, you know, rutting and those issues that uh, I'm not saying cancel them the rental, but there should be something in, in line that if there were repairs required or damage caused by them, that they'd be responsible for it, rather than just the township or taxpayer. With that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Well, one other thing, thanks for taking up the issue. <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to comment? Commissioners, uh, Pat Kovar, Hines Township Supervisor. I live, oh, maybe a half a mile from 
from the hot spot that everybody is talking about. And this, this business enterprise um, is connected to a township road. And this township road is primarily maintained uh, just for local traffic. And what we notice is, is that the road gets pretty chewed up. And I know that we have other township roads where loggers have come in and they chew the road up and then they say, no problem, we'll fix the road for you. And because the taxpayer of payers of Heinz have to come up with the money to fix these roads. And this adds a little bit of a burden to all of us. Be that said, the roads that, that are there do not have um, right-of-ways, they're cart paths. Consequently, if you park along, along the sides of those roads, you are basically trespassing on other people's property. But the main concern is, is that if we have a fire down in that area, it would be impossible. If, if there was something going on, it would be impossible to get any kind of uh, rescue trucks or fire trucks down in there, even maybe an ambulance. So when it comes to that problem, I, I, and I believe I read it in this, that they have to make some sort of concessions for parking, right? And that is, uh, that's really important in this case. So be besides uh, the upkeep of the road and the parking, I also have to tell you that I, I don't, I fish on black duck all the time. I stay away from that area. To get out of the wind, I fished in that area this last summer and that beach was total bedlam. There was no supervision and that's okay, except the music was so loud in that area. And I know that if you stay at a resort and you behave like that, they will tell you to turn the noise down, to behave. And the people that have already talked about how they've kind of lost their, they, they've lost their uh, uh, sense of living in the country and peace and quiet, and they're right. I agree with them. And it gets to be, it gets to be loud and noisy there. Uh, the other thing that I was noticing, it says that the Environmental Services Department shall investigate all complaints of this or ordinance. And I will show my ignorance by saying, what is the Environmental Services Department? Is, does that deal just with the environment or does it deal with, with law enforcement? What do you deal with that? Yeah. Okay, but planning and zoning, when you when you have uh, uh, let's say a complaint about people driving across your yard, I don't know what that's got to do with zoning or planning. That has to do with law enforcement, and consequently. I would like to see something in here saying that not only would it be the environmental services department, but maybe something else. And that something else may make them want to try even harder to keep, keep the, the peace. And one last thing. I remember years ago, we have a lot, not very far from our place and, uh, it has nothing to do with a, a B and B or anything, but it does have to do with some people from out of state bought a lot, and then they had all of their friends bring in multiple trailers and this and that and whatever, and they were they were running up and down the roads in four wheelers, and the game wardens were just having their 
were just licking their chops because it, it was continual writing out tickets. And finally, Bill Patnode wrote him a letter. And he said, you know, you got to learn to get, get along with your neighbors. And after he wrote, wrote that and sent it to all of them, it actually calmed down quite a bit. But I, that's neither here nor there. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Hello, um, my name is Miles Rowland, and uh, <clears throat> my wife and I own a piece of property on the Mississippi River, just south of Lake Irvin. And uh, we have uh, 28 acres on the river. Our house, uh, from our house, you can't see any other prop, any other houses from it. So it's nice and private. And we were doing a, a Airbnb with, with the property. Uh, and we're doing the upper level of our house. And we reserved the lower level of our house for us. And so if we, if we ever have a guest that comes in that we are concerned at all, then we have the right to stay in the basement in the, in the bottom level and monitor it so we can be right there on the site. So uh, as far as parking and stuff like that, so not, you know, not all of the Airbnbs are, are a small area. We have, like I said, we have 28 acres. We have on the one side of the river, we have uh, 22 acres. Um, so there's parking for, for trailers and we had snowmobilers come with uh, three pickups and trailers and snowmobiles and nobody else even knew that we were back there you know because nobody sees uh, past the trees and everything back to the private property and so far the guests that we have had have been so respectful and decent and it's it's been a pleasure for us so far uh, and it's interesting to see the people that are coming to uh, stay in Bemidji. Our first guests were, were actually a couple from California traveling across the United States. And they looked around, they liked to bike, and they saw all the bike trails around Bemidji area, and they were attracted to that. And then they came and stayed at our place, and they just loved it. And I would, anybody that's wondering about it, too, I would encourage you to uh, go to the um, like the Airbnb sites or whatever, and you can uh, go click on the sites and you can read reviews and and see the appreciation that the people have. Um, right now we have a far five star rating. Um, my wife and I are um, doing our best to keep it clean and respectful to people. And also, I am so sorry for that. The trouble that you've had, it sounds like a nightmare. I can't imagine. <clears throat> and, but I know our neighbors around us, we have a great relationship with our neighbors. And they even, we have neighbors that come and walk their dogs back on our property. It's like almost like a park back in there. And uh, so we have this great relationship and they have no issues at all with, and um, we have not had any of those problems, but so they're all are, you know, they're not all the same, what I'm trying to say. Um, <clears throat> one of my thoughts is that because we have, you know, that much acreage um, and the continuous issue, so we have several different lots that we've, we've bought different parcels and put them together. Um, and I, cause many lake homes have a main house and then a, like a guest house or something. So I would wonder if, if I were to build another cabin, 
you know, and then here we are on 28 acres. Um, that would keep me from being able to then, um, you know, do a vacation rental with that other cabin too. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. It wouldn't be like a big resort or anything, um, but it would be a guest house, you know, for when we have friends and family over. So that we could do something with. But for Brenda and I, we've owned this property for 30 years now and um, we're close to it. And we live over by Bagley. And so we're within that 30 minute to 35 minute range. So I hope we can fall within the acceptable uh, guidelines with that. But anyways, we've had a great experience with it. It's a way for us to, um, help to pay for our taxes and insurance. And the people that come here love it. They use the restaurants, uh, they use the bike trails, they snowmobile, um, go to the parks. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Miles. Um, are there any other comments? Commissioners, Deb Schumann, 17538 Grassy Island Lane in Hines. And um, this morning we noticed we were looking at new listings, you know, we're kind of are looking for like a piece of property. And there's a place on Black Duck Lake and it's advertised. And then the realtor put in there, great place to start up a VRBO. So not only are people starting, you know, the realtors are starting to market it that way. And uh, two guests ago, we had the group of 17 snowmobilers and they were causing problems all over the lake because we were getting calls. Do you have people next door? We have a whole bunch of people that are trying to get off the lake on our property. They don't want to use the public access. They just, you know, follow snowmobile tracks. If they think they can get off, they do. And they're out there stopping them. They're, you know, they're calling, do you have neighbors up there again? They're causing problems. I'm like, yep, we've got 17 of them next door. And the last thing was we had a nice conversation with Tyson Williams, who is the owner next door. This is by Christmas time. And he said, what can we do to help this, to make it better so we can keep this going and keep the neighborhood happy? And I said, it'd be great to have an on-site manager. And he goes, well, who would stay if they had someone on site to make sure they weren't causing problems? And I think that in and of itself, he even realizes there are problems if you have someone on site, they may not stay. And that's why we're in the problem that we are. I really appreciate the people who are responsible VRBO, VRBO owners. And they do, they're on site, they monitor, they keep track of things. Our own, our neighbors next door are not those people. You know, you call them and we get the, I'm sorry. And you call them about something else. I call because this, set of snowmobilers, they were driving through the yard and on their septic system. And I thought, geez, they probably need to know this. So I called and they said, oh, we'll take care of this. The next group that came in did the same thing. So either they're not telling the people, they're not getting the message through or the people staying there just don't care. I don't know what it is, but we try to be good neighbors. We've always been good neighbors with them, but enough, you know, it's just about enough. And we're looking at our third summer of who know what, who knows what. So we wish we lived next door to these people because that would be wonderful. But um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Deb. Hello, my name is Elisa McNallan. I'm at 2784 Raincourt. Um, I also want to start out and apologize for everything that you've been through because it sounds terrible. It sounds terrible. Um, we, my husband and I currently have a, an Airbnb short-term rental. It's not just Airbnb. And we've run one in Pennington on Moose Lake since the summer of 2018. And we're kind of lucky in that situation that we border state land and it's very private and, and we have 
neighbors that actually um, enjoy um, our guests. But I think part of the reason is, is I is, and I think Michelle too, um, I heavily, heavily vet my guests before they even arrive. I want to know um, who they are, um, why they're coming, what their intentions are. If if they even if there's a hint of a bachelorette or a bachelor party, it's a no go. Um, I want a certain age requirement for the responsibility. Um, I guess I didn't even start to say why we got into this. Um, my husband and I discovered Airbnb not by being hosts, but by being guests. We have seven children, and you can imagine with all of them playing sports and traveling to Fargo for overnight tournaments, um, basketball, baseball, pretty much our whole lives, um, cramming seven children into a hotel room is not great, and putting splitting this up into two is really expensive. Um, and what do you do with them bouncing off the walls? So um, we discovered Airbnbs found homes where we could cook our meals and you know have refrigerator space to you know pack the coolers and um, put baby bottles or whatever. Um, so it kind of got us thinking. You know, there's not really a lot in Bemidji that we've seen, and um, we used to open up our home for free for other traveling moms. I'd say, hey, do you need a place to stay? And you know, we would just we have tree forts actually. We'd put up some baseball players. Um, but about four years ago, we saw this really dilapidated um, old cabin on Moose Lake, um, decided we'd love to try to turn it into something and you know, use it for ourselves. The only way we could afford it for ourselves was to offset some of that expense with um, sharing it with others. And honestly, it's been such a blessing, not just the financial part, but the relationships. Um, I've met wonderful people. Um, I've had guests from far away too. I've had Chicago, I've had New York, I've had uh, Philadelphia, I've had um, just so many people um, that have come and enjoyed Minnesota. Um, I have a guest scheduled to come that has said this is their first time to Minnesota. They specifically picked Minnesota because they saw my cabin. They thought that looks like the place I need to be. And so that's really like thrilling to me. Um, and what, what we always do is um, we I direct them to um, shops. I say, you know, if you're going to, I mean, I don't want to say specific things here, but I will give my recommendations. I will, um, try to support local businesses, restaurants, meat markets, um, local, local places, chocolate shops, whatever. Um, and I, I feel like sometimes people think maybe our Airbnb is taking away from the hotel business. And I, it could not be farther from the truth, at least in my case, because ours is a destination and people said they're coming to Bemidji because of this. And so um, I think sometimes we're drawing more people in, in the good people. <laughs> I would say not necessarily your people, um, but I think there's a huge difference in um, how it's being, you know, who's running it. Do you care about the quality of your guests? Do you care about your neighbors? And that is super high on our list to do that. Um, I was going to say, um, I, I have an, an, a second Airbnb now and, and I'm working out the kinks with my neighbors and it's a little more, um, I'm really, really trying to make it the best for them. Um, and I think part of the hesitation is just the idea of what could happen and not necessarily what's happening. I mean, obviously it's happening to you. Um, so um, I know the road maintenance thing. Um, I kind of joked to my husband, I, well, if we were actually on that road, I have... I have five drivers in my house right now. I have a house full of teenagers. And I think you'd probably not, I think you'd rather have a few guests every other week than our family coming in and out of every day. Um, but it can be a concern, obviously. Um, I think that is it, but I appreciate your time. And I just wanna say that I think it really brings value. Um, we've made these properties better already, um, the outside the landscaping. And I, I would hope that, my current neighbors will see the the appreciation of their properties. You know, when you're when you you're keeping it up and making it nicer, and and instead of the shambles maybe that it started out to be. So, um, I think there's definitely a need, and I I have no problems whatsoever with um, holding people accountable to do it well because that needs to be done. Um, so, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Risa. Are there any others? We have anyone online that may be joining us? No. 
All right. I'll, I'll ask one more time. Are there any others that would like to approach uh, the board? Um, if not, um, I'll just close. I, uh, I had offered a few people to give their public comments here for them if they wanted, if they didn't want to come, whether they're for or against or whatever. And only one person said, yes, please do. I just wanted to make sure that they weren't here and going to come and speak on their behalf. But um, Becky Livermore talked to me this morning. Her, her and her husband said that they're, they're against short-term rental possibilities and don't see the benefit to the community. The only benefit is really to the owner. But if we can't make these illegal, then this ordinance is a good start, but needs more teeth for enforcement. Um, I read this to her and she said, yes, that's how I feel. So I just, I wanted to pass it on, not um, just because I told her I would. And then um, the last comment I just wanted to make was that the, the next steps, the plan is to take these public comments and um, we'll, we'll send out a, an email with a summary to the planning commission and we'll ask them what the, if, if they want to incorporate some changes or if they stick with the, the recommendation to the board and then, and then at some point in the future, we'll bring this back to the board for consideration. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brent. I'm, I'm glad you uh, clarified the, the next steps in the process. And, uh, uh, you know, I thank, uh, you know, the citizens for coming out uh, to provide, you know, your testimony. I think that helps us um, in our in our decision in, in this process. You know, it's, it's not an easy decision, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I hear both sides of, of, of the, the issue. So it, 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 I believe it's our hope you know, at, at the board here that we can uh, resolve this and, and um, everybody is, is uh, happy with the result. So, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say to Brent, this is a living document. It's not something that is going to be in concrete. So it's a place to start. We'll do the best we can with the start. But if things don't work out, we still can change and add or subtract whatever. There's not, yeah, I'll close the public hearing at this time. So being uh, no other business under the public hearing, uh, we will move on to item nine, swearing in of new sheriff deputy. And we'll, we'll take a couple of minutes to so the. Thank you, everybody. Look at you, how long is, uh, what's the record for the longest meeting? <laughs> I think I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I <think> you're right. <laughs> at least with this cohort. <laughs> I, I think you're with the uh, dissolution of the methadone clinic. Oh, yeah. That, when, was, that was a longer, too. That, yeah. was my, that was my first year in 2009. Okay. I remember and, that. And uh, we had uh, 100 people signed up for the public hearing and they were standing on chairs in the back. <laughs> and that was, that was my first year as a county commissioner and I was chair. Oh, uh, oh that's right, you were chair. Uh, first year. Welcome, welcome chair. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, again, uh, uh, do something that's very near and dear to uh, myself and to the sheriff's office. Uh, yes, uh, this was, uh, this is Ben Paoli standing there right here. Ben is a new deputy sheriff with us. Uh, he's been working since January 15th. And he was supposed to be here a month ago, but uh, he was working that day and uh, uh, business happened and he didn't get here to be, uh, be able to participate. So um, as I said before, uh, swearing in somebody, uh, uh, no matter what their role is within the sheriff's office, really does lay the foundation for what they do as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, in, as their job. It lays the foundation for how they do their job. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, if uh, more agencies looked at this um, and uh, decided how, this is how they were gonna operate their sheriff's office or their police department based upon the foundation that we swear to uh, the oath of this office and, and the oath that they're going to do, I think we'd be a better place. And we'd be a lot less people regulating what we're gonna do in the future. So uh, with that, uh, Ben Powell, Ben, uh, it comes from uh, the Metro. He went to school at BSU and after his, or during his schooling, he interned with us. So uh, he's not new to Bemidji area. 
uh, he loved the idea that uh, uh, moving to Bemidji and uh, being an outdoorsman that uh, he turned into, that he just loved to be back in this place again. So it had things that he wanted and desired. And of course, the agency that uh, we are, I think, uh, is a good draw for him to come back. So um, with Ben, uh, his girlfriend, Sarah, and then uh, the gentleman over here in the uniform uh, is, uh, he's a friendly police officer, but he, uh, but Ben grew up uh, around him and uh, uh, he was a mentor to him and he was baseball coach, right? Yeah. I get that right. And uh, so he's here representing his uh, parents who couldn't be here as well. And uh, I appreciate him coming up. Thank you very much. So we're going to step off here to the right and we're going to go through the motion and uh, we'll get this taken care of. So I appreciate your time. Give this to you so you can read this. Raise your right hand, Ben. Aye, state your name. Benjamin Hall. You solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. To support and uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and the laws of the state of Minnesota. You support and uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and the laws of the state of Minnesota. To serve the citizens of Belcher and the county, the state of Minnesota, the United States of America, honestly and faithfully. To serve the citizens of Belcher and the county. The law of my supervisors and fellow deputies to obey and enforce the law without fear, favor, or discrimination to class, color, race, or creed, and have the courage to hold myself and others accountable for our actions. Conduct myself to, to be loyal to my supervisors and my fellow deputies and obey and enforce the law without fear, favor, or discrimination to class, color, race, or creed, and have the courage to hold myself and others accountable for our actions. To conduct myself at all times in accordance with the highest moral standards, never commit any act that would reflect discredit on the Bell County County Sheriff's Office or any member thereof. To conduct myself at all times in accordance with the highest moral standards and never commit any act that will reflect discredit on the Bell County County Sheriff's Office or any member therefore of. To help those in danger or distress when a necessity arise, lay down my life rather than swerve from the path of duty. Help those in danger or distress, if necessary, arise, lay down my life rather than swerve from the path of duty. And at all times, fulfill my oath as a Bell County County Deputy Chief. And at all times, fulfill my oath as a Bell County County Deputy Chief. All this I solemnly swear to the best of my knowledge and ability to do so. All this I solemnly swear to the best of my knowledge and ability to so help me God. Thank you, Sheriff, and welcome, Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So that will bring us to uh, <clears throat> yeah, item 10A, Beef Proclamation. So by the power invested me, no. <laughs> so yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Christy and uh, and James Dodds reached out to me, um, and, and I believe that and believe Tom, the, the administrator, uh, kind of late last week, and and um, and uh, it was kind of Tom's suggestion to to just kind of do it like this and add it to the agenda. Mm -hmm. I, I I think this is a pretty easy one. I mean, it's I think it's neat to to highlight how important. Um, Egg is in in this county, and I think I think Jim made a good point. He said, you know, kind of jokingly, I thought that we were just a, a, a timber industry, but you know, we're timber tourism and lots and lots of egg. Uh, in fact, even I think one of our colleagues is uh, heavily invested in in egg. <laughs> um, so um, I, I'm I I, uh, I I would move that we uh, uh, um, uh, I guess I don't know what the verb is embrace this resolution or support this resolution. And this proclamation for uh, a National Agriculture Week that uh, begins on the 20th. And I'd like to second that uh, possibility, even though we don't normally bring on something new like this and, and do it, I think this proclamation is, is due for a lot of our folks within the, the county. And the, the timing factor. That, that was the, yeah. yeah. That yeah. Uh, also made this uh, acceptable. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. So we have a motion by Commissioner Olson, second by Commissioner Anderson. Is there any further discussion? Uh, being none, um, a call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carried. 
So with that, I would like to read um, the proclamation that we just passed. National Agricultural Week Proclamation, March 20th through March 26th, 2022. Whereas there are more than 2 million farm families in America, whereas there are close to 70,000 farm families in Minnesota, whereas there are close to 600 farm families in Beltrami County, whereas Beltrami County agriculture and related industries support about 2,500 jobs, which accounts for 9% of the total jobs in the county. Whereas Beltrami County has close to 170,000 acres of farmland, whereas the Beltrami County agriculture and related industries total, total sales generates close to $400 million annually. Whereas there's an estimated 12.5 million in labor income supported by agriculture and related industries in Beltrami County. Now, therefore, the Beltrami County Board of Commissioners hereby claim the week of March 20th through March 26, 2022 as National Agriculture Week and recognize to all the important contributions of Beltrami County Agriculture. In witness whereof I have here unto set my hand this 15th day of March, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. So uh, we'll bring us to the assistant veteran service officer position, correct? correct. My notes are all over here. So. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Shane? But thank you for sticking around. So I, I, I think uh, uh, after you guys stepped out, I think it was, uh, we decided that we were gonna, somebody was gonna make the motion for, for item two or? or well, do, do, Mr. Do, Chair, do, in that case, just a, for discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion that we, uh, that we uh, create, no, I don't have it in front of me, that, that, we, that we return or create the, we add the 25% FTE and create the assistant uh, uh, VSO into a full-time position. Second that. We got a motion by Commissioner Olson, second by Commissioner Anderson uh, to create the, the three-quarter time, or is it half-time? Go to, from three-quarter to full-time. To full-time. Fully benefit. Yep. And fully benefit. Right. So that was option two presented by the uh, county VSO officer. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair, with a friendly amendment to make sure that we change the agenda bill to say uh, no net change to our budget. Right, yeah, it's with yeah, with, for, for the 2022 budget, yep, yeah. that it's budget neutral. Yes. Yep. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> if there is no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for sticking around, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. He was just glad to be sitting here without Scotty next to him. <laughs> Have a little bit of a break. <laughs> so, so what's the deal? You're going to hire Scotty back? Is is? <laughs> oh, this, he's going. You're going to make him apply, right? Yeah. yeah. Make him apply. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Shane. That will bring us to the. Um, item 11, redistricting discussion. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I'll just ask this question to the board, I guess. So we will have a public hearing on the 5th and we still have to tweak everything based on what the city does. One of my fears is that the city is not, now I don't have the dates, I forget when, but we have to be done by the end of April. There is a scenario where the city will not be done by the end of April, and then will push us into, into non-compliance. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And that, that I, it hasn't happened yet, but when you look at their timeline of doing the three readings and having to have proper notice and, and everything, um, 
I don't know how they're going to do it. And I'm really frustrated that if, even if they do get done, say, you know, if they get done anytime after our last meeting in, um, in April, which would be the 19th, that's going to make things awfully difficult for us. So we're probably going to have to consider if we're able to, we're going to have to consider having a special meeting that's at the only way around, right? At around. the end of yeah. if the city is done in time. Right. And that is a huge if right now. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to set, say that because I think that that's kind of also part of what's going on and, and listening to some of the discussion. Now I understand that they're going to have a meeting on Friday and I, I know that, that they're going to be, they have some maps, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, they have some maps that are pretty big changes. Um, I know that there's, there is one scenario and, and, and uh, where it showed Ward 1 and 2 with Eccles, I think. But there's a scenario where 3 could come in and keep 1 and 2 from being contiguous. Um, and so I'm just saying that to say that, that there's a very good chance that what, whatever we do right now, whatever we come up with, depending on how the wards get put together, it could really throw a monkey wrench into everything that we're doing. And so while we're having this important heated discussion, I hope that we're not beating each other up too much. And then we find, spin, right? yeah. And then all, all we did was, was, spin. was argue for, for no reason. So, so I don't know what the way forward is. Um, I, I, I think that, um, the, 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 I think that the first three maps were that, that, that came out on Friday are a good start looking at some of these personally. I, I think that of the other maps, they look again, like, like we're, they're not compact. Um, some of, some of them are, I don't know. I, I, I really haven't looked at them very much, but, um, when we, sorry, when we have the public hearing, after we have the public hearing, we can move things around or we can listen. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what our timeline is. Um, I, my guess is we would listen to the public hearing, maybe have conversation and then come back on the 19th. And then, and that's when we'll, we'll assign, assuming that everything goes well and we're able to, then that's when we would decide on a map. So I don't know, I guess that's, that's where I'm at. I'm not making a suggestion. <laughs> Just, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, full disclosure, okay? I, I like running that way. Reed, Commissioner Olson, you were saying that you thought there was something going on behind the scenes with why map four, five, and six came out. Um, late Friday, when those maps came out, full disclosure, I texted Commissioner or uh, Administrator Barry back. I did not contact the committee. I just contacted Tom and aired my displeasure. I didn't ask him to get more maps. I didn't ask him to do anything. All I said was the gist of the text back to him was, I got it. I don't like it. That's all I said. Okay. okay. So just so you know that, and that's, Appreciate that. that's right from here. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I, and I didn't do a reply all to Jody and to Kevin. They didn't see any of my comments. I just responded to my County administrator saying uh, they weren't three good choices. So what I'm asking with all due respect is at this point, I think I'm echoing what you said, Reed. We need to keep all our options on the table. If we see a map that works for everybody, isn't that the good solution? If we look at it and every commissioner district says, that's a good outcome for me. Isn't that really what we're trying to accomplish by redistricting? Mr. Chair, I, what I would, how I would answer that is I think that that is a false premise. The question is not how does the map work for me? No, I, I'm sorry. sorry and, okay, okay. Yeah. How does it work for our for the, Yeah, okay, okay. Right? Yeah, not for me. Yeah. But if it works for the board and mm -hmm. if it works for our county, if we, if we all of a sudden see map number eight, nine, or 10, and all of a sudden we all look at it and go, well, you know what? That takes care of a problem and that takes care of a problem and that takes care of a problem. And the overall best solution is this map that we've seen. I, I just... I fear the timeline thing. You know how many times we get our foot stuck in the door when we don't have enough time for all of us to look at information that's brought to us and review it and weigh in and ask folks how they feel too. So uh, that's, that's my point on this. I, I think there's a number of different ways of doing it. And with all due respect to Commissioner Sumner, we don't wanna bring 25 maps to the, to the hearing. 
But I think as a county board, we can sure look at and narrow that selection process down to a reasonable number and a reasonable approach to solving the county board's issue of bringing something forward that will be a good solution. Go for it. Mr. Chair? Yes. The question, uh, Jody, I had, uh, you alluded to the fact that before we have the public hearing, they, there'd have to be the maps provided, correct? The, that we're going to look at the choice. Uh, the reason I ask that question is, do we have to decide on the three or four or six or seven uh, maps tonight? Or is that down the pipe that we can still decide on that? By statute, the maps do not have to be published until after they are whatever map is adopted. So by statute, the only map that I have to publish is the one that you adopt. That being said, one of the things that came out of the meeting um, two weeks ago was the request that get maps to the commissioners as soon as possible. And as soon as the city decides on their um, redistricting, get those maps up on the website so that citizens can see what you will be discussing at the public hearing. Um, so that, that would be the only reason why having, having the maps available. There aren't any publishing requirements until it's adopted, but if we have them up on the website, if we have them at Tom's office available for citizens to come in and see, then they would be able to comment intelligently on on what they're looking at at the public hearing. And Mr. Chair. And, that, and that's kind of why I, I asked that uh, that some maps be presented, you know, give give the board ample time and, and the public, you know, plenty of time to to go over, you know, the maps because ultimately, you know, I mean it it's them that are being affected, you know. And Mr. Chair, if so, Craig and I were both at the one of the hearings that was here in town that I think the state Senate put on, right? And I think uh, Commissioner Gosvick spoke, but he didn't say, "Here's my map. Here's what I want." As as a member of the public, he said, "Here's here's the principles that I want you to write." I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I mean that's generally what the the what the um, testimony was, where people were saying, "Here's what's important to me." You know, um, there were tribal members saying, "Let's try and keep the tribes, the the three area tribes. It'd be great if." we could keep them in, in, in a Senate district. And that end, ended up being what happened. But other, I, I'm trying to remember, there are other people that said, we don't want our community split. You know, I remember seeing other people from other, um, other communities in, or reading in the paper or something, um, uh, communities that there were, there are some municipalities and Bemidji kind of was split when we annexed in um, Northern, but say our, our community is split into three different Senate or the way that you have your map, it would split us into three different Senate districts one town, please don't do that to us. So that's, that's, is that, that's kind of the information that we are, are gonna be getting from our, our constituents, not do this map or do that map, but here, or I mean, I suppose if the maps are out there, they'll say, this is the map that represents my, my principles. Yeah, right? So I don't mean to ask or, or a bunch of dumb questions, but I'm just trying to set the, the kind of the, our, our, um, our, our, not our rules for the road, but kind of our benchmarks or our guidelines. I, I will check on it, but I believe statute says you need public, you should get public involvement, public input. It does not say, other than having the public hearing, how you get that public okay. involvement. So that public involvement could be just like what you said. In theory, this, we would like to see this, this, and this, or it could be, you know, if you have two maps that you want to go forward with, the public could sit, weigh in and say, I like map A, next one, I like map B. That is up to the board, what level of public involvement and what type of public involvement that you're requesting, other than you need to have the public hearing. And to have however many people may show up for the public hearing, to have them choose between a couple of maps isn't really fair or realistic to the rest of the residents of the of the county i mean the 46,000 residents have 20 of them 
say I like this one better than this one. Sure. sure. Yeah. You know? Well, that's kind of why I was saying that it's more like the the their guiding principles right. that exactly. that we're interested in. You know. Um, just you know, I would have to be really really smart to be able to have done the done math, math for them. <laughs> 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 just <laughs> this is a yeah. This is definitely a, a simpler map really? than than yeah yeah. I I do think that if you if you opt to collect citizen comment in theory or what their priorities are, it would be wise to maybe, if you can put a work session in before your meeting on the 19th, so you're able to discuss what their what the citizens' concerns were so that you don't come to the meeting on the 19th, have the discussion and have to make a decision. I think that was why my recommendation was to have the public hearing on the 5th so that as commissioners, you had time to discuss what was talked about at the public hearing. Mr. Chair, we may want to, I, I, I hate to make more work for us or whatever, but I mean, we showed today this, this early, I want to say this morning, earlier today when we, in the work session that, you know, a 25 minute slot in the work session probably isn't going to suffice. So do we want to consider having a special work session uh, somewhere before the 19th? So that we, or, or yeah, before the 19th, after the, after the public hearing, before the 19th. So on the 12th, Tuesday in between the two. So yeah, yeah. Three to five. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was just one item, right? You no, know, if we, wrong with that. If, yeah, if we, yeah. If we reach consensus, yeah. we agree on an approach and a mm -hmm. direction. Yeah. yeah. So three to five, I propose on April twelfth. And and again, just to be clear, we won't make a decision that day. We'll just we'll hash it out, and that's when we can have a, what I imagine will be a, a fairly robust discussion. What? <laughs> this group, right? And and then and then on the nineteenth, then we can come in kind of with that, and then we will be in a better position to make a vote where we're yeah. Okay. And that, that, and then again, that's, I mean, we'll make that decision. I think we can call that special, that, that work meeting. Can we call that on the, on the fifth? Because if, if I, we got to kind of look and see what the city does, I mean, this is all predicated on the city getting their job done. There's frankly one of those new options that I looked at uh, um, where if the city went with what they proposed in the first place, that option wouldn't even work because district right. five would be less than the minimum that is allowed. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. If they you know, put the three thousand seven instead of three thousand eight nine, that's you know, pretty good swing, and that actually reduces that one enough to not be meeting the minimum, I believe. And there are options also that, if the city, depending on where the city's numbers come in, it would change that five percent rule. So some districts that mm -hmm. would have to rerun wouldn't have to rerun, depending on where the city ends up redistricting. And and that could create another two or three options of how we resolve our issues. And, and it'll render some other ones moot. Exactly. That it, throws it, a couple out. Right. And it gives us some options on some others that says, hey, there's there's a workable plan for our county. And but we can't do anything. The, the city people that I've talked to said they were frustrated because their staff brought one solution to the, to the table. Right. And that's what they had to discuss. Well, you know, you got to be empathetic there. If you're on a good side of that map, you go, oh, well, that's okay. I guess I'm good. But then if you're on the other side of that, you go, can we see some other possibilities? There are other solutions here and there are other compromises that can be made to make this thing work. So I, I think we, we can sit here and talk nice all night, but we got a big variable. And we don't have the city. And we don't have to stop the work session. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, if, if this, if, unless yeah, what the publishing for that. Yeah, I don't know about special sessions and the county attorney is not here. Unfortunately, he's home ill, but. Um, well, why don't we do it? Well, we've, we've we done it. it. I, I, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's good. I would. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. Set it. let's make the formal uh, announcement, advertise it legally. And then if we have to, there you go. Home, we yeah, can yeah, yeah, that, that is true. The safest way to do this is for you to make a motion tonight to go into a special session with the per, with that topic as the sole topic for April the 12th from three to five. 
and then we'd be on the up and up. We can publish right away, and then we can always cancel later if we need to. But I, I think you're going to want that meeting anyways. I'm going and to make that motion that we meet from three to five on April 12th, second, for redistricting discussion of right. the five county board members. We've got a motion by Commissioner Lukacic, second by Commissioner Anderson. Any further discussion? I'm just trying to look at my calendar to figure out why that's not going to work. Oh, the well, better, oh, Commissioner Olson, if it doesn't work, we will we'll make it work for all five of us. We can do a special on a Wednesday. No, that'll that'll work. On Monday, work. we yeah. can do a Thursday. Yeah. You can work your schedule. Yeah, it, I mean, that's usually Tuesdays are pretty good for me just because, uh, you know, I we block them out. Um, yeah, that'll work. Yeah. All right. Uh, being no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So Mr. we have Chairman. a... Mr. Chair, just one other thing that does need action tonight, we are hoping, is the unorganized precincts. Did that? Because yeah, we put that, that, that in the consent the agenda. Consent. That was on yeah. consent. Okay, yeah. just wanted to make sure we had that. Thank you for that. See, we're, we're efficient. We're yeah. efficient. <laughs> That's great. We say that every time. <laughs> right now, right. At, 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 at 20 to 7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Saying, well, we may be dysfunctional, Tanner, but we're efficient. <laughs> <laughs> we're efficient. Definitely dysfunctional. So we will um, move on to the administrator's report. Um, I'll keep this very brief, uh, commissioners. You know, typically the proclamation process would be one for those that you know proclamations that aren't necessarily completely tied to or or immediately tied to the county's business. Well, I bring them to you. You can make a decision. We'd hear it at the next meeting. We didn't have that luxury in this last proclamation because of the time constraint. But we do have another proclamation that's been recommended. This is the one for National Therapy Animal Day on April 30th. So we have plenty of time. I wanted to get that in front of you, see if that's something you wanted to support. If so, I can work with the representative to get the proclamation drawn up. And then you guys can review it and make your decision then. But before I even entertain that, I just want to make sure that was something that, I mean, because that's pretty far outside of essentially county business. But, you know, certainly it's within your rights to do. Uh, so I just wanted to get the board sentiments as to whether or not you know want me to entertain working with the representative on that. It may sound, if I may, Mr. Chair, it may sound like kind of a, a small kind of a discussion, but I think the reason they're doing it is that it's a bigger discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it's becoming more and more prevalent. I'll, I'll tell it like I do most of my issues from my point of view in the construction industry and the housing industry. There's a big discussion because we have a housing development that says no pets. Well, now all of a sudden you have pets that are are related to the service, service dog, service animals of all kinds. So uh, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying it's a big topic and it's a bigger discussion. So uh, let's all do some homework on it. And, and I think we all were sent the email yeah, right. request from this individual so we can do what we want no, I, thought I, was the only one. <laughs> I, I thought i was the only one that got that email i sent it to tom thinking that i was the only one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no well it sounds like you'd at least have to like to have the discussion right so we'll put it on and then now uh, I'll, I'll work with her to work up the the document then you guys can make a decision later that's um i had a few other small things uh just important dates maybe uh I'll be out of the office March 23rd through the 25th. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, and uh, OSHA will be on site for consultation on, on the 23rd is... through the 25th. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't the timing perfect? <laughs> no, we've invited OSHA to come in as a consultation. This is a proactive on our part, uh, so nothing to be concerned about. But just wanted you to know that I'll be on March 29th and 30th. And then the AMC Leadership Conference is scheduled for March 30th through April 1st, if you were interested in that. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Tom. All right, we'll continue on with uh, Commissioner's Business Items, Legislative Lobbying. Uh, anyone? <laughs> I don't have anything tonight, Mr. Chair. I just oh. read this fast. The only thing I have on legislative and lobbying is the reached out to Representative Stauffer's office to try to help us with a, a state park issue, the National Park Service being a challenge on getting our easement for the uh, 2020 uh, road project. And if they don't get that taken care of soon, then that's gonna delay that project. And so they are thankfully helping 
hopefully move that along for us. Thank you. Um, and then uh, might as well part of the commissioner reports the uh, whole county solid waste meeting. Um, the uh, recyclables are staying up in price and steam sales have been pretty good. So that part has been good. However, um, other things uh, are causing the uh, talk of potential tipping fee increases. Don't know when that would be, but at some point, I think the writing's on the wall if we'll see some increased cost in the solid waste. And depending upon how much that is and when it is, as to when we'll potentially have to address increased costs from our solid waste department. Uh, and one kind of neat thing with our solid waste department that we had our meeting this morning, at, and we are hoping to go live April 1st, and looking like things are going well for our new point of sale system, electronic stable take credit cards for for point of, or for um, you know garbage fees if uh, people come through with a couch or something. You don't have to have cash anymore and keep and having things more automated and electronic. So that's all. That's it. Nobody yeah. has cash anymore. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So we're getting that's... up to the up to speed there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You think someone's sitting in line with the two two old couches on their trailer and they sit in line for 35 minutes and then they get up there and then they say, okay, that'll be 1250. Yeah. And then all I have is my my debit card. Well, we don't take cards. <laughs> you know, that I, I've gotten that call. <laughs> Uh, I really quickly for lobbying, uh, uh, Commissioner Sumner and I were at the uh, legislative conference um, and we uh, went around and talked to our, our representatives and they all promised they were going to do everything that we needed them to do. So we're done with that. No, it was good. It was good. We had a, we did have some good conversations. Uh, it's all really quick, you know, but then then last was it just this past Friday that uh, 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 Tom and uh, Commissioner Anderson and I went down to uh, Park uh, Park Rapids to talk to Utke with some other Senate uh, with uh, other um, uh, commissioners that are part of Prime West to talk about the the lawsuit and kind of give them some background on on DHS uh, pushing us around and so that was that was I think that was a real successful um, uh, uh, meeting as well. Um, I'll say I got to sit in, uh, I'm the alternate on the emergency radio or emergency communications board. And the first time I did it, I learned so much. This time, everything was so over my head that I just didn't have, it's this alphabet soup of, of um, uh, if you don't know the jargon, it is so hard to follow. And I was happy to have Chris there. He, Chris was in person, Chris Muller. He does a great job representing us. And I think I said that last time. Um, I'm, he is a wonderful ambassador for us to send across Northern Minnesota and represent us. So. Thank then you that's for doing that for me. Yeah, I enjoy it. I, you know, if you're dumb, the dumbest person in the room is the one that's going to learn the most, you know, <laughs> um, if they're at least smart enough to follow the conversation, which maybe this time I wasn't always able to do. Good. Good. All right. <laughs> Review upcoming meeting schedule. Um, we can do that at your leisure. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Commissioner Anderson, second by Olson. Any further discussion? If none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.